Hello. I'm back. Hold on, let's just sort my mic out. Yep, that's better. Right. How's everyone been? Did you all have a nice weekend? It was Memorial Weekend in the US, yeah? Am I right? So I hope you all had a good one. Right. Oh, God, oh, yeah. So I just had to move my chair a bit forward. Okay, let's see. I've, I've just come across this one little video today. A sweet look, another little video that apparently Seth released. Seth put this out. And it's a YouTube channel and it's Seth Rogers' YouTube channel. So I don't know how true that is his channel, which I don't. I can't say yes or no to. Right, anyway. This video was put out of Sebastian. Looks like when he's much a lot younger, a lot younger, which still knows. But I just hope Seth keeps some of these videos back for himself, because at the end of the day, that is all he's got of his son at the moment. All those pictures. And those videos. You know what I mean? It's got nothing else. I heard someone say today how uh, he's moaning because he hasn't got the, the electronics back of the law enforcement yet. But you don't hear Chris and Katie moaning. Right? Excuse me, but that's all he's got of his son. That's it. All he's got is his electronics. And they've got them at the moment. He's got nothing of his son. He just wants them back. He just wants them back to put them in his room again so that when his son does come home, they're there for him. He's staying positive. And that's what I like about Seth. Right? He's staying positive. About getting his home, his son back home again. And it really annoys me when I see other people putting him down constantly. We may not like the choice is choices he's making. Right? But what's that saying in life? You learn by your mistakes. You have to make mistakes to learn. So, and I'm not going to put him down for that. I'm not. As I said, it's, it's, it's like he's drowning. You imagine you're in a, a pool of water and you're going under, right? And you're just grabbing, and you're grabbing up to for a lifeline. That is what Seth has been doing for the last two months because for the first month he was he was okay but he was struggling he was struggling on his own and he needed help and okay these people come out to help him some were good some were bad but it's not up to us to, to, to say who we should have and who we shouldn't have Right. All I will say is there's a lot of YouTubers and a lot of viewers backing away from this case. Why? The only person this is hurting by doing that is Sebastian. It's this lad. This is the lad. This is the lad we are all here for. Sebastian Wayne Drake Rogers. 
Aye. Not for all this height that's out there at the moment. All I hear on YouTube at the moment is height. That's not helping find Sebastian. People need, there's time. It's like, there's time once we find Sebastian, one way or the other, and bring him home, one way or the other. Right, there's time for all this backbiting and whatever thing. You know what I mean? But please, I just wish people would see this up here in the head and think, you know what, there is time for that once we get Sebastian home. Let's put all that down. Let's put our bows and arrows down, boys and girls. And let's get on with trying to help find Sebastian and bring him home. Now, I've noticed one YouTuber, I, I don't know if he went live last night because I normally catch him in the morning. But I haven't caught him today. He's not been online. So I don't know if he went live last night or not. But I haven't seen any of him tonight, today. And that's sad. Because you see, I was seeing him every morning. I'd wake up, make myself a coffee, sit down, turn my TV on, put YouTube on, and that is the one I'd watch every morning. It's like your favourite TV show. You get up and you watch in the morning. Well, here's my one... He's my go-to YouTuber every morning. And I've not seen him this morning. Don't know why. Don't know if he... Why he didn't go live last night or... What? I don't know. But you, I've not seen a live anything. The only one I've seen is the one I saw the other day. Which I think was... Was it Saturday? No, it wasn't Saturday because I wasn't online Saturday. Uh, before I did. So I haven't seen anything since then. Oh no, tell a lie. I was watching him, I think it was Saturday morning on, on my TV. I was watching him, yeah. But it was from Friday evening. I don't know if we, I haven't seen anything new since then. So it's a shame. It's a shame. Because no one is talking about this lad. Everyone is talking about Tony, Seth, CP, KP. Right? But nothing of their interviews that they're bringing out at the moment are helping find Sebastian. Nothing. Right? And I apply that with Seth as well. None of his interviews that he's bringing out is there to find Sebastian. But then again, he hasn't brought, done many. It's Tony's been doing them. So Tony's at fault there. He did one interview which I've seen, which was... was Bullhorn Betty, and I thought, and I sat and listened, and I thought, thank God you've actually done an interview about Sebastian, about Tony. How long have you been here with Seth now? A month, two months, how long? And this is the first time you've done an interview with someone about Sebastian and about the search for him. So, but the quieter it goes, the less inform, less pull, less uh, airtime Sebastian gets. So I'm putting a call out to all you big YouTubers, all you big channels out there. I'm only small fish here. There's still some here, still some fighting the battle for him. 
but please get back on that horse and come back and fight this battle for Sebastian. Ignore what anyone else is saying. It's water off a duck's back. Ignore it all. But get out here, get back out there and start helping Sebastian. Anyway, I'm going to show you this little video that I came across today. Just literally minutes before coming on here. Right, so I'm going to play it. Hopefully, I've just put it to my page. Did I not put it to my page? There we go. Do that. Come on. So let's present. Uh, take this off. Now, this, as I said, I only just come across this literally minutes just before coming on here, and then I looked at the time and oh my god, it's gone eight o'clock. Supposed to be going live at eight. So, hang on. As you can see, it's got Seth Rogers, but I don't know if that's Seth Rogers. I don't think it is. You know what I mean? But. We'll see. But I'll just hope he keeps some of the videos and some of the photos he's got back for himself. Right. That's Sebastian there in the blue. He was having fun. He was younger there, obviously, you can tell that. But he was having so much fun. So, I thought I'd just show you all that because, as I said, I've only just come across it now. So some of you may not have seen it yet. It's on my Facebook page. I'll put the link in the description so that you can go back to it later, if you wish. Or save it to your own profile page. Right. Anyway, the big talk of the town at the moment is the interview room. Chris McDonough with, oh, what's his name? I can't think of his name. Um, oh, I can't think of his name. But he did the gigging interview. Well, it wasn't an interview. They did a, a, a video. And they was going over the first interview they ever did. Now, I always said that first interview they ever did, that Chris and Katie did, was the rawest and most vital video you can have. Because after that first video, people made comments like, oh, they never mentioned his name. They didn't do this. They didn't do that. They didn't say this. You know what I mean? And I said then, you watch in the next interview, they'll mention his name and I'll add more to the story. And they did. And then every time they did a, a, a live on a YouTube channel, they added to the story. 
Yep. I always say, if you're telling the truth, the truth don't change. You know what I mean? It's when you lie, lies will change. Because you feel, oh, did they believe me when I said that? I think if I just add this to it, it might make it a bit more believable. That's just my opinion. Right? So, they're looking at the first interview. Now, I like Chris McDonough. I'm not going to put him down. Not like some YouTubers I've heard today, and I'm thinking, really? So, I don't know what everyone thinks of this video. I don't know if you've seen it. If you have, come and chat and let me know. Say hi. I do not bite. I'll jump. I'll jump. You may need to turn your own volume up because I've got my voice and sometimes um, people will turn this earlier and have to be I don't think the highs. So if you can't hear can you turn it up on your own laptop or tablet or phone? An amazing uh, welcome to the interview room everybody. What an amazing uh, Sunday this is going to be. We are so excited that each and every one of you are here. Uh, as you can tell, uh, I have a very special guest, my dear friend and colleague, uh, Steve Johnson. And we want to thank each and every one of you uh, this evening, our subscribers, our Patreon members. Uh, and of course, we have the best mods here on YouTube, Teresa M, Maui Girl, Mimi J2, and our newest amazing team member, Laura Wadi. Now, also, I, I just want to, before we kick this thing off, uh, I want to raise a little awareness as to the importance of what we're doing uh, tomorrow in this country. It is Memorial Day, and this is a time for each and every one of us to reflect on approximately 1.1 million uh, Americans who have given their lives uh, in war, so that you, myself, and many millions of others in this country, approximately 356 million Americans, have this opportunity tonight to talk about the things that we're talking about. So tomorrow, reflect on our freedom. Reflect on the fact that it was given to us uh, through sacrifice and a gift. And I'm grateful to have been a son, my brother and my sister and I, of two Marines. These are my parents, uh, my father and my mother, both in the Marine Corps, and both are buried at Section 34, 3574, is the grave site in Arlington National Cemetery back in Arlington, Virginia. Always remember, uh, my father. My father fought in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, and he would he instilled in each and every one of us, our the us as children, that he was a survivor of those wars. And to always remember on Memorial Day, those that gave all. So I want to honor each and every one of the Gold Star families out there uh, who have lost a loved one. God bless you on this Memorial Day, and we will not forget the sacrifice of your family members ever. Steve, do you did you have a family member in the military? 
you know, I, I didn't my, but, uh, um, my father-in-law served. And so, um, but I didn't have any on my side, but, uh, man, I, well said though, Chris, uh, I appreciate what your parents did and what they instilled in you. And I know I have, I've worked with several that have served and, and, uh, my deepest respects to, to all of them and, and all the families. Yes. And that's also extends out to our, uh, European friends, uh, even in Australia who fought uh, for freedom over there and, uh, in England who fought for freedom. We're so grateful. Well, as you can tell, I've got a dear, dear friend here. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk about missing Tennessee boy, Sebastian Rogers. Many of you have been asking uh, for our way in on this case, so I could have thought of nobody better uh, to talk about statement analysis than Steve Johnson. Uh, he is not only a colleague of mine in the Cold Case Foundation, uh, but he's the managing partner and lead trainer in a company called truth2lies.com. Uh, but Steve's not only an amazing human being, he spent 28 years in law enforcement uh, mostly as an investigator, and he has been vor dire in many court situations as an expert interviewer, and he's a certified statement analyst and has expertise in identifying uh, deception, latent contact, which is inf- content, which is information hiding in plain sight. And tonight, he's given us a, uh, a little thing. He trains civilians, too, for corporate America, and he said, if you use this code that I just put into the chat, uh, you will get a, a discount on some of his civilian training, but he also trains law enforcement uh, from all around the world on how to the psychological profile and verbal and written statements. Um, and so I, I, I find that really fascinating that, uh, you know, information hiding in plain sight. I've always loved that. Uh, he's, a, he's also a certified handwriting analyst and a certified uh, voice stress analyst, which is a CBSA. Uh, he's a member also of the Cold Case Foundation. So uh, he's got quite, that's his short list, by the way, everybody. That's just his short, his short list. So we're grateful to have him here here uh, very much. So get over to his website. It's down uh, in the show notes tonight. It's www.truth2lies.com, truth2lies.com. Uh, and so with that, uh, Steve, I know I call. Right, before we start, if you haven't already, can you give this video a like so that it helps with the analytics, analytics or something? Right? So please go below and give us a like. Uh, hold on. So. Oh. Right. So this is where they start the the talk about, and I must admit there's something, they stop it, and I'm thinking, you know what, I've said that myself, I've said this, I've said that, (laughs) but there's some things in this I didn't pick up on, I didn't pick up on it, so let's watch and listen. All of you yesterday, (laughs) literally full transparency here for everybody, he's been so busy. Um, and I told him, I said, Hey, have you heard about this Sebastian Rogers case? And he said, yeah, you know, kind of, but I really haven't had time to dive into it. And I said, perfect. You would be the the perfect guy tonight to to take a look at this case. Uh, I have purposely, you know, laid low. I've done a couple, made a couple of comments on the lab over at uh, Josh's channel with Dr. Picado. Uh, and, but I have not shown Steve this video. I sent him the links last night and we both got permission from our wives to talk about it tonight so uh i cannot wait to hear his analysis of um, what's going on in his mind about what's going on potentially in their mind and we're going to talk specifically about the parents first interview uh, on the news there are so many things going on in this case um you know he's been missing obviously since the uh, 26th February, so we're coming up on three months. My personal opinion, the authorities are working overtime on this. And um, as a result of that, I'm sure there's a lot, a lot, a lot of information um, behind the scenes. But I told Steve just before we went up here, uh, I have the sinking feeling this is a Summer Wells 2.0, which has caused a lot of 
emotion out there. Um, you know, we're coming up on on her uh, anniversary soon. So Sebastian's a 15-year-old autistic boy. If you're not familiar with this case, which I'm going to be surprised if you aren't. However, Sebastian's a 15-year-old autistic boy from Henderson, Tennessee. He was last seen by his mother, biological mother, uh, Katie Proudfoot, and stepfather, Chris Proudfoot, before going to bed. Katie said she heard a thud from her son's room around 10 p.m., and she told him to go to sleep. She told the police the next morning she went to wake her son up, but found he was not in his bed. After searching the house, she called um, the police. That's kind of been backwards on a couple of statements. But Sebastian had been seen early in the day in Henderson wearing a black sweatshirt, black sweatpants, and glasses. The authorities have been working on this uh, nonstop. They started an extensive search, including canine officers, horseback, drones, and helicopters. And they also drained a pond near his home, but nothing was found. Search dogs uh, have not picked up a scent for Sebastian, according to some of the reports. Uh, and this was the most interesting one. Authorities searched a landfill in Kentucky where the family's trash had been taken, uh, but nothing turned up. So on March 4th, the teen's mom and stepfather gave an interview to TV News uh, uh, approximately eight days after. Now, I have a problem with that search on the, at the landfill. Because even if it was just where their trash was put, it's not, they only spent one day there. One day. Because apparently, when the trash people go there and dump the rubbish, they have a, they are told a specific area where to put it. Right? Like a zone, Pacific zone section. So when the police went and said, look, we were looking for the, the trash that was dumped here, brought here on the 26th of February from Hendersonville, this area, right? They said, oh, it's in this zone, right? But we all know when the wind blows, things can get moved about. Yep. If you live in the UK, you see it every day on the high streets. When the bins are overfilled, the wind catches it and it blows about. So I don't think one day was long enough. Unless it was just to say, look, just for the police to say, look, we are doing something. We are looking. Because I don't even think the Kentucky landfill was the correct landfill to be searched. That's just my opinion. But I did talk about that last night, was he? Yeah, last night. About the landfills. And believe me, I've been doing some research today about... Uh, I said last night I wanted to find out how long a body has to be on alive before it would before it start uh, the body would start releasing the fluid or even leaving a smell. You know what I mean? Because the smell is so potent; it's it gets into every pore of of the of that room, or, or the car, or the mattress, or the carpets, or the flooring, it gets into it all, right, and believe me, what I've been reading up on today, I wouldn't want to get buried now, I want to get cremated, anyway, let's carry on. Sebastian's disappearance, and that news outlet footage is what we're going to analyze tonight, uh, so it appears uh, to show some activity around three in the morning, according to some reports. But those lights have, uh, there were some lights behind the house, flashlights or something, but those have been attributed to potentially. Those lights were not behind the house. Those lights were on the corner as it, behind, as you go past the back of the house of the neighbor's house, heading towards the corner of Stafford Court. That's where those lights were. 
nowhere near the back of their house. A trash truck in the neighborhood right behind the house as he was coming through uh, and picking up items. But uh, the authorities have not come out with information uh, additionally about those lights, but they're saying uh, they're, they've taken it off the table. What they haven't taken off the table is that, quote, no one has been cleared. Not cleared anyone, quote unquote. So the authorities are working hard. Uh, TBI, uh, Secret Service, a variety of um, resources to put into this. And I have to say, it sounds like summer 2.0. So that's the gist of it. Thoughts? No, opening thoughts, Steve? It's not summer we, uh, kick off into this thing? I think your um, analogy to Summer Wells is 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 accurate. I, you know, you and I did I don't know three or four videos on on Summer Wells, and those are worth going back and, and looking at later. Um, but that's exactly what it reminded me of. And there's there's nuances within this interview that are very similar to some of the things that we saw in the Summer Wells case. So um, I think you're spot on. And interestingly, you know, Summer Wells still. Has not been found, and and um, you know I hope that I hope that Sebastian is, uh, of course. But um, we're this. I, I love exploring the very first interview that anyone does. That those interviews, like the one we're going to watch tonight, we're going to analyze tonight. Those are the interviews that are uncontaminated. In other words, the the parents have not had time to um, react to things that other people. Uh, are interjecting regarding the, the investigation. I mean, they, they are a little bit, but but this is their first their first interview. Actually, the very first one would be the 911 call, and then this would be the second one. So um, so we're going to get some good some good analysis out of this interview. And and our goal, my goal, and in, and in, in what I do in in my space here is that um, my goal is to get inside their head and um, understand at a deep level. What is the information when, you know, you, you read in my bio about the information that's hiding in plain sight, that latent content. It's like, it's like latent fingerprints. They're there, but you can't see them until you apply the uh, material, the, the tools, whatever it is to, to make those fingerprints come to life. And then you can, you see them and you can lift them and you can use them. We do the same thing with, with the statement. So we're not really investigating the person. We are investigating the words that they use, which is going to reveal what's going on inside their brain. Uh, which is what we want. They have the interview, the, the the information we want, and so we just we want to get inside their head to extract it. And they do that with their words. It's it's a, it's an amazing. It's the best tool I ever I ever learned. And I just, and now my thirty fourth year and, and working with law enforcement investigators, I still feel that it is the most effective tool um, that I could have ever learned to to solve cases. And so I'm excited to dive into this one. Awesome. So if you were uh, let's say an agency called you in. Walk people through how that happens. You, uh, what what takes place when an agency says, "Hey, we've got a statement, Steve. Uh, can you walk us through this? Tell us what you think." Yeah, um, and yeah, I've worked on several cases for for agencies, uh, cold cases and current cases. And uh, when the agency uh, calls me, they can get a hold of me through my website. Or um, I'm not hard to find, and my and so when the agency gets a hold of me. Um, typically it's, it's a, either a 911 call they want analyzed or right. actually so quite often it's, it's an interview and I've done this a little bit and just go to here. Uh, I want to just go back here. And really pick it apart. Very similar to what we're going to do here, but in more detail, obviously we only have so much time tonight. So, but it's very effective, hugely effective. Come on. And, and, you know, Chris, we've, we've, Work together on some cases with the Cold Case Foundation, and um, yeah, we've we've used this for numerous numerous cases. So we just did last week. Oh, just last week, yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so let's get started. Um, I'm gonna we're gonna or our way of doing this, guys and gals, uh, and friends and neighbors, is I like to let Steve listen. He'll say stop. We'll go back if he wants us to go back, and then we get to pick his brain a little bit and uh, see you know how what's coming out there and what he's seeing that we may or may not be seeing so uh you ready steve yeah let's go okay i'm gonna put the um video up here and, and we'll start first just express i can't even imagine as a parent 
what you two are going through. How would you describe the situation right now? How now, you may have trouble hearing this. My sound is all up as high as I can get it. Uh, but I've watched other videos to YouTubers today going over this, and now it's having the same problem. And they, they accept followers, uh, subscribers, to either use headphones or if they could turn it up on their end. Because I was watching on the TV and I had to have it up on 15 to hear the video, to hear this. So that's loud for me when I normally only have it on 5. So please, if you're having trouble hearing it, I've got the um, subtitles up. If you need to hear it as well, to check your own. can you check your own volumes? Make sure it's uploading up. Thank you. Okay? How are you coping? <laughs> um, We're on a constant roller coaster ride of helpless and hopeless and many other emotions all in one, and it's a never ending roller coaster. It doesn't stop. It won't stop until he walks through the door. I wouldn't wish this on anyone. Let's hold it right there, Chris. Okay, so a couple things. <clears throat> um, first thing is that stepdad, his name is Chris as well. So stepdad Chris, uh, he says, well, first of all, I got to know that mom did not answer. And and I'm I'm wanting to hear certain things from mom as, as a biological mother. I want to hear right away her expression of concern about her son and what he is experiencing at this time. He's been missing for eight days. And um, I know that the, the reporter, she targeted, you know, that question to what they have been feeling, but the feeling of any parent, the grief over their missing child is going to override anything. The only problem I have with this here is that the fact that Steve said he wanted to hear. No, it's not that. He, he should have put it like, it would have been nice. I would have liked to hear the say. You know what I mean? Not I want. I would have liked to hear her say. That they may be experiencing themselves. That feeling of what is Sebastian going through? Um, what is he experiencing? Does, does he... Did he find some shoes? Did he? Does he? Is he getting fed? Is he staying warm at night? Is he? All these a myriad of things. Um, did he find someone to take care of him? Is is he scared? Is he okay? And, um, just a myriad of things, and that would override everything else. And so I'm wanting to hear that from mom right away, but she she couldn't come up with anything. And I've seen that in other cases where, uh, where the and I should say cases where the parents actually were had some guilty knowledge of the disappearance of their of their child. And when they don't come up with it right away, it's it's almost as if they were asked something that they weren't expected to be asked. And and then they because lots of times parents will go into um, the their once they're asked questions, they, they they have a narrative and they that's what they think is it's just enough. Whatever's in their head, they think it's enough to suffice um, the questions that they will be asked. And if it's if they're asked a question that doesn't quite fall in line, they're, they're kind of at a, at a loss of what to say. And so I'm wanting to hear mom express things about Sebastian and, and, and she couldn't do it. Um, she's what she did say is I wouldn't wish this on anyone. Chris, that refers to her, what she's going through, not what Sebastian is going through. And that's the thing that really caught my attention is that she has put the focus on herself rather than her 15 year old son. Uh, and he's autistic and he has special needs and, and, and I just don't, that just was abrasive to me. It, it, it struck me as not what I expected to hear from biological mom. Awesome. Um, There's, go um, ahead. No, you, you're, you're on a roll. I'm listening. Well, if, if you have something to say about that, cause I'm going to go back to what dad, what Chris, stepdad Chris said. Yeah, no. And, and the rocking, uh, that sometimes is a stress relief. Mm -hmm. Sometimes for people, you know, they're they're releasing that 
uh, tension and that that uh, energy. Because to Steve's point, they have a they may have something going on that we don't know. And by the way, just for the record, in the beginning of this, everybody is innocent until proven guilty. We're not here to say, you know, they're they're innocent or they're guilty. That's not what we're doing. We're analyzing from a professional perspective, where both of us have testified in court as experts in in our field. Steve is an expert in analyzing this uh, statement analysis and identifying deception. It is much different in a criminal case than it is in the civilian court for a civil case. Because in a criminal case, you have jeopardy and you have people that could lose their liberty. So they have a lot more to lose than just their house or their money. Uh, so this is a different type of analysis that we're looking at. So I, I don't have any other thing you know, to dovetail into what you've already said so far, Steve. Okay. Um, going back to the first thing that, that uh, Chris said, he said, we're on a constant roller coaster of helpless and hopeless. Now, <laughs> here's the thing about this, and and some people, I, I hope you can see what I'm trying, what I'm going to say here, what, um, where I'm going with this. That is a uh, portrayal of emotion, such as you would read in a in, in a novel. It is something that, in other words, something that. I don't expect to come from a de facto innocent parent. Uh, it is something that is that would be said to cover because it it um, to cover up some uh, some guilty knowledge. Let's say it is something that appeals to the emotion of the listener, um, of the interviewer, of you know everyone out there listening to the news. Chris is appealing to that emotion. And I almost feel bad calling him Chris, Chris, because I like you so much. And I'm saying Chris, you, and I'm and I'm referring to this guy here. So call, um, me, call me Mac. <laughs> okay. And we'll differentiate the, the dual. <laughs> no, so the, the important thing is that the first thing that he went to was helpless and hopeless. And Chris, it's just that a de facto innocent person uh is is going to have hope. Um they are gonna hold out for hope. I know of cases where a child disappeared and the parents held out for hope that that child is going to return for over 20 years. And even when investigators finally uh, discovered that the child had been murdered, the parents refused to let that into their vocabulary and declare the child deceased. They, for 20 years, they referred to him in the present tense and as, as alive and, and going to come back. And my point is that it's very difficult for, for them to let go. Now, this is a stepdad. It's easier for him to, to let go, um, for sure. And men in general can also let go easier than biological mothers can. Um, but mom didn't answer, and so he went to... Seth, the bio father, the father of Sebastian, he's got hope. That's all he's got, is hope. And he's not letting that go. Helpless and hopeless. And that is... Uh, not only an appeal to to for listeners to believe him, but um, it is a an indication that there is no there is no hope in his mind that Sebastian is coming back, and they're they're helpless. And I'm in my mind, I'm thinking, are you kidding me? You're talking to the news right now. Uh, you should be portraying this. You should be so happy that we're on the news. And, and hey, everybody, we're getting the word out. Here's what he was wearing, and let's go out and find him. And it'd be, it'd be like, that, I would be very hopeful at that point that I'm getting it way out there to everyone. Now, we're gonna, we learned that this interview came eight days into the disappearance, and I'm wondering, what is the holdup? Why hasn't this happened before? And it's my understanding that the parents wouldn't do an interview. I don't, I, is that correct, to your I, knowledge? I do not know that, Steve. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I won't, I won't touch on that then, but I would have, I would like to see the parents right away coming out and saying, Hey, our child is missing and he, this is who he is and let's get the information out. But it's, it, it, that didn't happen. And instead we have this portrayal of helpless and hopeless and, um, mom not telling us the things that sh a, a de facto innocent biological mother should be telling us about the concern over her son. Instead, she's focusing on herself. So. That's so far. That's what we got. And I love it. So let's. Yeah. And uh, and I guess we can call him CP. CP. All right. Good that, deal. And that way, folks don't get my name and his 
name mixed up. Good. Thank you for that. Which is the same name. That was <laughs> from the chat. All right. You want me to keep moving, brother? Let's go. Yeah. All right. Here we go. I know we're about keeping hope alive. I'm sure that's in there somewhere. Oh, yeah. It's going to come home. He's going to walk through that door. <laughs> and the street will be flooded again with family and relatives all the way. He's not walking through that door, Chris. Because you're not there. The door is bolted. He's not. Th you're not there. So even if you, if he is alive and he came home, right? You're not there. And I read a comment today and a post. And I thought, yeah, I'll, I firmly believe this. Apparently someone asked Chris, If Sebastian would be able to uh, get on Google Maps, would he be able to find his way home? No. Straight away, he said no. Now, we know he plays Minecraft. Minecraft gives you instructions of how to, where to go, where, when to turn, you know what I mean? A bit like Google Maps. So if he did get hold of te some technology where he could get onto Google Maps, he's only got a punch in his address, 108, Stafford Court, Hendersonville, Tennessee. And it will direct him right there. It will tell him when to turn, which way to go, right or left, straight ahead. You know what I mean? It will tell him. So if he can do Minecraft, then he can read a Google map. So if he does get, if he was able to get hold of an electronic, like a phone or something like that, I'm sure he'd be able to find his way home. Or somewhere safe, like local, local police station. Punching that. Right? Because... On a phone, when you go on Google Maps, you get your, you have your little spot, yeah, your little marker, and you can punch in local police station, and it'll tell you from where you are to where the local police station is. So, and he could, he would be able to read that. It tells you to take the next left, take the next right, go straight to head. You know what I mean? But Chris, quite. Firmly said no. Waiting to hug him, love him, and that boy's gonna have more friends than he knows what to do with when he comes home. So, so hold up right there before we get into the next part. Um, it's interesting that that interviewer, she's the one that, that she sensed that something was wrong. You can tell, and she introduced. Um, well, how about keeping hope alive? Is I'm sure that's in there somewhere, isn't isn't it? And she's she wants to hear that. Uh, she's as an interviewer, as a uh, uh, working for the news. I'm sure she's interviewed a lot of different people, and watched a lot of interviews. And and she knows what comes out of the mouth of a parent whose child is missing. She's wanting to hear certain things, and she didn't hear it. And so she's, uh, I'm sure she's she's helping him out here. And um, it it just it couldn't come out. Mom couldn't get it out of her mouth. Again, why aren't we hearing that type of language out of her mouth? Uh, she's it's void. She's void of it. Yet it's, at different times, we're going to see during this interview that she's very teary eyed and she's sad. And 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 it's and I believe that she is. Um, I believe that they're they, you know, they're real tears. Chris, you and I have both seen fake tears and in, in interviews <laughs> many times and uh, the fake emotion and whatnot. I, I think the mom is sad here. Um, it, it doesn't speak to being sad, doesn't speak to uh, innocence or guilt. It's just she is sad at the, at the situation. But if she really was concerned about Sebastian, those words about him would be coming out. She wouldn't be focused on herself. And so this indicates to me that she is more in a mode of self-preservation than anything. So I'm going to see how she does throughout the rest of the interview. And, and hopefully you know, I want to hear it change. I don't want to see at the end that, that she's went through this whole thing in self-preservation mode. I would like to see it change to where she's expressing more concern about Sebastian. Okay, so I'm going to back up just for a second. 
to so that the audience can hear those points that you just made. And and I agree with them, agree with you a thousand percent. And that sadness also could be, it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, it's sadness towards the totality of the circumstances. It could be sadness that, you know, if there's some type of jeopardy there, that this is kind of a release of that of that stress. And that's where also the, you know, the soothing of, you know, the rocking. I've always said that rocking was her way of saying, like, we know there was a script. We know there's a script. Because they keep adding to it. As I said, if you tell the truth, you don't add to it. But if you're on a script and then you you say what you think they want to hear, but then you see these people making comments, well, she she never mentioned his name, he never she never did this, they never did that. They will change the script. They add to it to make it more believable. Right? Well, I've always said that rocking of her back and forth. I believe it's her way of self-soothing. Yep. I also think it's her way of saying, I want to tell the truth, but I can't. And that's her going back and forth. And when she closes her eyes to, and they ask her a question, and she'll close her eyes and her head goes up or her head goes down. It's like, oh, God. What have I got? I can't remember what I've got to say. And then sometimes she'll look over at Chris, so he takes over. Back and forth uh, comes into this as well. So I'm going to back up just for a second, listen uh, to how this unfolded. Family and relatives all waiting to hug and love him. And... That boy's going to have more. Now, the interesting part there is he keeps shaking his head no. Uh, uh, yet he's talking about all the family and relatives coming in. Yeah. To, to hug him and stuff. Uh, any thoughts on that, Steve? Yeah, <laughs> it's it's an indication that in his mind he knows that that's not going to happen. And uh, you know the the brain is so powerful, and what the brain knows is typically comes out physiologically um, and and verbally, linguistically. What the brain knows reveals itself, and that's why the polygraph works, the voice stress analyzer works, and why statement analysis works so well if you're skilled at it. And so it, he's he's saying one thing, but but that. But that head nod is the, is giving us a, a different answer that that's nah, really not going to happen. Yeah, and if we go back, if anybody wants to see, we did an analysis on uh, in Summer Wells' case. You can see it in the playlist uh, early on. Steve caught so many things in that situation, and and it was indicative of the father talking on the news, going like this, you know, <laughs> going like this. Mm -hmm. All right, so that good catch. Hang on. He's gonna walk through that door. <laughs> And this street will be flooded again with family and relatives all waiting to hug and love him. And that boy yeah. had more friends than he knows what to do with when he comes home. I never noticed that before. Sorry, I'm just eating a crisp. Sorry. Um, that slight shake of the head where he mean where he's saying something like, "Yeah, he's going to have." Like, normally, he's expecting to say. Yeah, when he comes through that door, he's got, and his head is nogging up and down, I to say yes. But it doesn't, it goes left to right, as though to say no. Oh. So, so here we are, eight days now searching for him. Walk us through that Sunday night that he went missing. So, walk us through, we've got so many people who really want to know, okay, <coughs> how did this happen? So, can we just walk us through that night? I get the sense that she's really concerned about that question. I mean, oh, she... yeah. I love those questions. And 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 for your viewers, if if they don't know, that's that's one of the questions that, that you and I would ask in an investigation, especially with a missing person or a homicide. Hey, describe your last moments with your loved one. Describe that last day with, with Sebastian. Um, and if it if there was something amiss, if something bad happened, it's going to make them very, very nervous, as you know. Um, so it's interesting to see now with that question and where it focused her brain, what she says here. So many people who really want to know, okay, how did this happen? So can we just walk us through that night? Um, we were out and about that day. We were having a really good weekend. Um, 
we got home. Uh, everything was pretty normal. He was playing in his room. Um, when I told him to go to bed, he did. <laughs> um, he said, good night, mom. I love you. Um, say good night to his puppies. Um, a little bit later, I wound up going to bed. And um, when I woke him up for school, he wasn't there. All right. So there's actually a, a lot in that. Um, she doesn't realize she actually skipped over. I mean, she, she described that day and, and, and evening uh, very succinctly, um, but skipping over a lot of information, what they did that day, uh, other conversations. Um, she didn't say a whole lot, but from in, in my perspective, what she did say was actually pretty revealing. Um, so the, the first thing that she said was one of the first things was that it was that day was pretty normal. Um, now, whenever I hear somebody refer to the day as being pretty normal, I'm on alert right away for it not being a normal day. Mm. Um, I hear this more, most of the time when I hear the portrayal of normalcy, uh, it has turned out to be anything but the norm. And so I'm, I'm on high alert now. Why would she say this? And, and I want to hear other things about ex from ex in, in experiential language from her. We did this. We went here. We went there. Um, I tried to get him to wear his new shirt. He didn't want to. He said, Mom, I'm going to wear this one instead. You know, little things, little nuances about the day. But we didn't we didn't hear those things. She skipped over a lot of those things, which is more, more times than not when somebody wants portrays the day as normal. It's it's a way of saying, hey, you should believe me that it was an, it was a normal day and not ask me any details about the day. Just accept that it was it was a good day. It was it was a normal day or they will say some things that and not in this particular case, but sometimes they'll portray it as normal, saying something in present tense, indicating this is what we always do on our normal day, and it, and it allows them to not say what actually happened that day in, in a past tense. And so um, it's kind of two birds of the, of the same feather here. Um, she's telling us right away, normal day, so but I don't hear the language of, this is what we did, experiential language. So she's, then she went to, um, I, I told when I told him to go to bed, he did, and she kind of laughed. And, it's what is that? It's it's a reference to him not going to bed. Him, you know, times I should say times that he hasn't gone to bed, and so she's she's kind of laughing at it, like, um, you know, for for once he did, or or this time he did. And I've, um, it, the problem I have with it is that it is a portrayal or a reference to something negative that Sebastian could have done. Um, so I'm I'm now on on alert. And what she says next kind of seals the deal for me. And I don't like what I'm hearing here because she says, he said, I love you, mom. And he went to bed. Now, saying I love you, saying I love you is something that we all do. We, <clears throat> I, I'll call my wife. I'll talk to her on the phone. I'll, I'll say, I love you, babe. Um, when I'm leaving, I'll say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm running out. I'll be back soon. Love you. Uh, my daughters are here um, when they, they leave or going somewhere. All right. Love you. We say, I love you a lot, but we don't have a need to tell other people that, Hey, by the way, I told my wife, I loved her. You know, if we're asked about our day, we just say, Oh, I had, had dinner with the family and, and oh, my wife and I. It's a bit of me saying, like, whenever I see my kids, my son and daughter, I always say, love you. When I leave, when I phone them, love you. When I finish the call. <laughs> but like when I'm so, say I had to call off my daughter, <coughs> right? I'll talk to my son. I say, "Oh, I had a phone call off Jay today, right?" My daughter. And uh, we talk about what we was talking about, yeah. But I don't say to my son, "Son," and when we finish talking, I said, "I love you." I didn't say that. I don't say that. Because Simon knows what I say, because I say it to him. It's, he knows instinctively what I will say on every phone call, whenever I see him. He came over today to pick up the little, his daughter's bag that I left here last night. As he got as I got in the car to go, I love you. But 
if I was telling someone else about seeing my son today, right, I, I'd just say, yeah, they come over about quarter to ten-ish, ten o'clock, and took the bag downstairs to him. We had a little chat, said hello to the kids who were in the back of the car, and then they got in the car and left. You know what I mean? I wouldn't go into the detail. Oh, and as they left, I said, I love you. That's something I wouldn't say because it's automatic. You know what I mean? Everyone says, I love you. Whether they mean it or not is two different things, but they say it. So the fact that she had to point out, highlight the fact that he said, I love you. And I've heard another analyst mention, pull this up, about her saying that. Why did she feel she had to say that? Is to make it sound like, look, I must be a good mum. And you'll say the same, mingy mingy. I must be a good mum because my son said, I love you. And I went here, there, you know, to drop my wife off at the airport, whatever it is. And and those, these situations are, are situations where we would say, I love you. But it's the need here that, that she has to tell the world that, hey, my son told me he loved me. So that on top of it's a normal day and this little hint at a negative reference that sometimes Sebastian doesn't cooperate with me, doesn't do what I tell him to do, a little laugh about it. I'm, I'm, I'm now alarmed uh, be, because more times than not, when I hear this, I love you come out of their mouth. I know that it is often a time when if a crime has been committed, um, that that is typically the time that the crime was committed. This is particularly true in, in, in domestic situations such as this, domestic homicides, um, other situations similar to this. So I'm, yeah. I'm so what he's saying is because she brought in that point of him saying, I love you, it's her way of covering up the fact that at that time, at nine o'clock, when she asked him to go to bed and he come in and said, I love, love you pups, two puppies, and I love you, mum, and went to bed. That is when whatever happened, happened. Rather than say what happened and be truthful, she's making up this script that he went to bed, no ifs or buts, right? Now, I don't know any child who will go to bed without, oh, mum, really? It's only nine. If we haven't got school tomorrow, or we're on holiday, or whatever, you know what I mean? But okay, you had school the next day, but have you n ever known a child just go to bed? Right? Apart from my granddaughter who goes to bed when I tell her, come on, go in bed now. And she gets in the bed, snuggled down, I took her in, and she's away from the night. Even when my grandson goes in and climbs up the ladders to get on the top bunk, it doesn't wake her when he gets off the top bunk and he gets off very noisily because I hear him. It doesn't wake her. But she's three years old. You wait till she's about 15 and the mum and dad saying, Right, sweetheart, you got to go to bed now. You've got school. Mum, really? Dad? I can see it coming. Right? My kids would go up to their beds around about half seven when they was younger. As they got older, they went up there to the rooms about, well, my daughter used to go up about half seven, eight anyway. Well, once she come in full and old, because she used to do her homework. Then at nine o'clock, she'd turn the TV off and all, whatever she was doing, put her books away and go to sleep. My son, different story. He'd go to his room. But he'd sit there watching TV or listening. He normally had his music on on the TV, a music channel on. And we'd have to go in and turn it off when we went to bed. Right? Uh -huh. But it was, oh, do we have to go to bed now? Yeah, you've got school tomorrow. Come on. Up you go. Up to your rooms. You know the rules now. It's 7.30, 8 o'clock. Our time now. That's when like, you had like programs come on the TV at a certain time, which wasn't suitable for children. 
Like because of the swearing in it or the violence in it. Right, so that's when they put those sort of programs on about by nine o'clock it was like the cut off time was nine o'clock. After nine o'clock it wasn't suitable for children. So they were safe up till nine o'clock. So as they got older, yes, they didn't always go up to the rooms after them. They was all normally out playing in the summer till 8.30. You know what I mean? And then they come in, have a quick bath, get the PJs on, and up to the rooms. So in the summer, it would be like between 9 and 10, they'd go up to the rooms. But when I was younger, it was always half seven. I had them in that routine. So. I'm always on alert when I when I hear that the the portrayal of I love you, and the other thing is is that what that does is what she's saying is I I'm such a good mother that my son told me that he loves me, and and that, that even elevates this even more that why the need to portray yourself as a good mom, um, that is that is something in an in analysis in the analysis field that we really take note of that when there's a portrayal of, of being a good mom there's. There are many, many cases. It's in the Summer Wells case. There's numerous missing person and, and, and domestic homicide type cases. We see this where there's a portrayal of being a good dad, a good mom, a good guy. Um, and it's typically that portrayal comes uh, around the time that the, if a crime was committed, the crime occurred or, or right after because they're rehabbing themselves now linguistically, psychologically. They, they feel the need to rehab themselves, to make themselves look better, to feel better about the situation. And so for me, it's a pretty good indication that um, something nefarious, something didn't go quite right that night. And so for me, it's, 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 if something occurred, it was that night, not the next morning. Um, so yeah, I'm concerned now at this point already. So, and, and everybody, so everybody understands what Steve's doing here is he's kind of, this is, you know, he, he's not dove, dove into this case until tonight. I mean, this is literally the first time. So it's almost as if I wanted to present it to him in this video, you know, just fresh off the boat, for lack of a better term. And that is such a solid point about a domestic situation uh, for our viewers to understand, you know, when you have the, the victim looking at the person potentially doing something to them, they go, but I love you. Hey. And yet they're being abused or whatever the situation is. And that's the point that Steve's making here when he heard that, uh, and I missed it uh, until you just pointed it out, uh, that that is such a powerful statement in context to the experience level potentially of a domestic uh, situation going sideways. So uh, I'm going to keep moving. Do you want me to keep right, moving? Yeah, let's go. I noticed okay. it straight away in the first interview. So in your mind, that's usually around what time? Six, like you normally wake up around six o'clock? So were you instantly thinking something's wrong or were you like, he may just... Oh, one other thing I have to say about that last segment, uh, and uh, Mally picked it up as well, and I had her statement up there, but when I woke him up for school, he yeah. wasn't there. Yeah. How do you, how do you, how, I, that statement, you know, when I woke him up for school, he wasn't there. Well, how did, what do you mean? Was he woken up? Was he not woken up? What? You know, where's that going? What's your thoughts on that, Steve? Yeah, that's um, definitely something that um, it, it's incongruent. Those two things. When I woke him up and he wasn't there, well, you can't wake him up if he's not there. So for me, that is something that's not experiential. It's something that what happens in the brain when there's any type of deception, which if it's not experiential, then it's, you have a form of deception because uh, she's portraying it as, as experiential. It's something that actually happened. But what, what will occur in the brain is that there's so much stress there. In the brain from from the deception the brain knows what actually occurred and didn't occur and if she's now going to try to force uh the opposite out of her mouth the brain is like hey we know this didn't happen and it creates a stress in the brain it transcends the body physiologically and what happens is linguistically it will that we will often hear things like this that will be it will sound confusing it doesn't sound right it doesn't flow right it will be incongruent like like her words are and when i hear things like that i'm, I'm again i'm thinking wow this is what's going on on this on the heels of what we just talked about. And, and now I'm seeing this is called uh, carryover stress and in voice stress analysis, we would have carryover stress. She's still stressed about what she experienced that night. She's still having to answer questions about that. So she's still feeling that. And so it's coming out now 
uh, incongruent, confusion in the language, uh, incongruency is, is classic. Just be, are you in the shower? I took a in second, I took a second and walked through the house looking for him in case he'd gotten up and was trying to get breakfast or something because he did that sometimes. Um, about three minutes in, give or take, I was on the phone with my husband. I said, I can't find him. Um, he said, what do you mean you can't find him? I said, he's not in the house. Right, now, the, this is something that's bothered me. When she got phoned him and said, I can't find him. Now, I'll be going... <coughs> <coughs> if I was the person on the other end of that phone, someone phoned me up and said, I can't find him, I'd be going, can't find who? Because you've got two dogs in the house. Could, could she be on about one of the dogs? She's let out in the morning and she can't find him now because he's got out the garden or something. You know what I mean? But he automatically knew who she was talking about. I can't find him. Who? Who can't you find? <coughs> <coughs> you know what I mean? Then she could have said, Sebastian, he's not in his room. And then it would go like, oh my God, alarm bells would have been setting off in my head. What do you mean he's not in his room? Have you looked here? Have you looked there? Have you looked in here? Have you looked in there? You know what I mean? And then I'd be going, right, I'm phone, phone the police. Put the phone down now and phone the police. I'll be home as soon as I can. You know what I mean? But she didn't. She didn't do that. And so at that point, is that when you call 911 or what's going through your mind? She, well, we were on the phone. Let's stop there, Chris, before, before CP starts talking. Um, there's, so there's some things going on there. Um, mom is, she, she's indicating that she's certain that, that he walked out of the house. And, um, and I, I want to go back to a, something that, that's key there and the, in the, context of Sebastian missing, she said within three minutes, I was on the phone with my husband. So she brings that up immediately within three. Now, here's the thing. He's out of town. So he can't help. But she says in within three minutes, I'm on the phone with him. She has just brought him into this via a phone call. It's very important. Their conversation on the phone is very important. And I'm gonna dovetail back to something that we I didn't comment on just in the segment just before this, but if you remember, she said when she was describing the night that Sebastian went to bed and said, I love you, mom. And then she says, a little while later, I wound up going to bed. Well, what that is is a little while later means there's time that has spanned that she's not gonna tell us what she did in that span of time. Um, and she's not saying how long it was, but she just says a little while later, it's gonna, that's going to suffice for her. We don't know how much time span, but we now know on the back end that uh, she was on the phone with her hub, with CP for three hours, I believe it was, uh, before she went to bed. And now she's bringing in another, she's on the phone with him again. This phone conversation with him is going to be really key in whatever happened to Sebastian. Um, well, she qualifies it too, Steve, right? She goes, I can't find him. Well, uh, what does that mean? I mean. Did you, did you find it strange the way that she said that? Yeah. She, it was like she paused. She's thinking. You can see her gears going. Yeah. And it, let's play that back one more time for yeah. the audience and get a better context even yeah. for both of us too. Let me go back here just for a second. And by the way, everybody, I hope you can hear this. I've got it turned up full volume. So if you can't hear it real well, turn up your on your side over there, the computer on your side, just in case. Uh, I certainly want everybody to hear uh, what's being said here. Are you in the shower? I took a second. I took a second and walked through the house looking for him in case he'd gotten up and was trying to get breakfast or something because he did that sometimes. Um, about three minutes in, give or take, I was on the phone with my husband. I said, I can't find him. Um, yeah, I mean, that was just... Out of thin air. But you would already walk through the kitchen, love, to get to his bedroom. 
you know, three, three, within three minutes, I can't find him. Yeah. So, but, and it's almost a contextual statement where, you know, she's trying to put it into this anomaly of conversation where, you know, I, I've been looking for him and I can't find him. She's and, hoping it'll, it'll get accepted that, yeah. that it's going to be accepted. But what it, this has so many ties to Summer Wells because this is so interesting. It's very similar to when, when Chris, you were at um, the house and, and uh, mom is walking you through the, the house and you're down in the, in the, in the ba dungeon basement and mom walked you out the door where she's saying that she thinks that Summer was taken out of that door, that downstairs door. And, and she, she came out that door and I use this clip for, for my training in, in, in the, uh, my, the classes that I teach, but mom comes out and she says, I came out here and I said, summer. And the, the, but the con the context is incongruent with summer being missing. If she really was knew that summer was missing, she would come out that door and she would yell, she would yell summer. I expect the same thing here from this mother, Katie. I expect Katie to be saying, Chris, I can't find him. I can't find him anywhere. And I, I, I want to hear this the frantic, the, the emotion of, of her being just out of her mind, uh, frantic of that she can't find Sebastian, but that's not coming out of her, her brain. It's because why? Because it's not there. And, and what is coming out is her perception of reality. It's, it's what she actually perceived and the way that she perceived it. And it's like, I can't find him. It's like, Paul, oh, like it's, it's time. It's, it's time for the next step in this is what, what, what I, in my head I'm hearing, uh, having listened to so many of these and, and, so it's not congruent with what a de facto innocent biological mother, what should be going through her brain and, and, and how she should be feeling and how she would portray that as actually as what happened. Love it. Here we go. Hey, so what do you mean you can't find him? I said he's not in the house. What, what's your thought on the breathing here? Um, my thought is that it's the same. It's just a continuation of the rocking. Um, I, and, and, um, it's also a portrayal, this whole thing. It's I'm kind of, kind of jumping ahead maybe a little bit, but, um, as I watched this interview, I made a note at the end of, at the end of I'm making all my notes. And I made a, a note at the end that throughout the interview, I saw mom and, and, CP stepdad portraying spending more of their time and emotion or, or, or energy portraying themselves as victims rather than concern over other, the actual victim who is their 15 year old autistic son. And I think that is part of this breathing thing that I'm seeing here is that that is, it's a, it's a portrayal of, of the emotion, uh, how difficult it is. But I think that she's, it's also combined with, nervousness she's obviously nervous about this it's i would be um but i'm what i want to hear is if it's actually um if she's feeling nervous or, or stress about her son being gone I, I should be hearing all of us should be hearing the words that, that correspond to that we're not hearing that and so it has to be something else and so i go to well what else would cause that well uh with everything else that i'm hearing in the language I'm thinking oh, this is this is a nervousness because she is in self-preservation mode. She is trying to um, not say things that she shouldn't that might give her give away what she actually knows. Um, she's it's just self-preservation, and so she's trying to self-soothe to keep things under control. I believe it is nervousness, but it's it's not the nervousness that we should be seeing. It's self-preservation. Yeah, that's interesting. And Malik again she came up with another good one. It's Lamaze breathing, right? Pamp, pamp, blow. <laughs> there you go. So interesting. All right. And so at that point, is that when you call 911? Or what's going through your mind? She, well, we were on the phone and I was, I was like, is he on the other side of the bed? We, the Did he said while we were on the phone, I was there? I'm going to back that up for yeah, a second. Back that up. Yeah. Did I mishear that? Yeah. One, or what's going through your mind? She, well, we were on the phone and I was, I was like, is he on the other what was that? <laughs> That's a really good question. Did he say, I was there, or I was like, have you looked? You know what I mean? Could that be a slip of his tongue? 
I was there. Question. Did you uh, hear that? Did, yeah. Eric, did you guys hear that? Maybe I'm hearing something that I want to hear. Maybe, but, but everybody else weigh in. Just listen to what you, tell me what you hear. When you call 911, or what's going through your mind? She, while well, we were on the phone, then I was there. I was like, is he on the other side of the bed? We, the normal places he may be. And, it's, I, I, I can't make out. that one out for sure. I can't make it out. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So it, he wasn't. So I was like, okay, well, hold on a minute. And immediately after that, we called the sheriff's department. And, See, immediately after that, we, and now he, he joins the conversation, meaning he joins the event. Right. Yeah. That we is very strong. Just like you said, um, he, he's in it. Um, but interesting that he only puts himself in it after Sebastian is missing. Before that, it was, she was in it. He kind of left her on her own and, and now he's, now he's in it. And and he said, after that, we immediately called 911. And, and that word immediately is not necessary to say. Nobody would have thought to ask. We typically don't think to ask, did you, did you immediately call? Because this is a missing 15-year-old autistic kid who, I mean, there's, this, there's uh, real reasons to be concerned that he's missing. Nobody would have thought to ask, did you immediately call? But he, he put that in there. And it's, it's a, Chris, it's an emphasis on, look, we did, we did exactly what we're supposed to do. We're we're following the rules. We're doing what we're supposed to do. Um, and and I, I don't like it, actually. <laughs> I agree. I don't like the fact that it said that. But the fact that they're doing everything they should be doing, no. If my son or grandson was missing, my daughter, anyone in my family was missing, and it was in my house that I went missing from, I would not. Like, say I had my grandson. Right? Well, before I phoned my son, I'd be on the phone to the police. And then I'd be phoning my son. Simon, you need to, you need to get over here. His son's gone missing. I can't find him. And he's, if he said, have you phoned? Yes, I phoned the police. Get your butt over here now. You know what I mean? For, for me, that un unnecessary the use, the use of that unnecessary word is a convincer. It's a convincing statement in and of itself that they did what they were supposed to do. And who portrays himself as as good people that, that are doing what they're supposed to do? Typically, it's people that have done something that they shouldn't be doing. Because the people that are de facto innocent and and the actual good people don't have a need to 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 uh, re rehab themselves, to bolster themselves, to make themselves appear better. They don't use a lot of unnecessary words like that. Uh, so that in and of itself, I know it's one little word, but but added to everything else, it's yeah, it, it, it's I'm stacking things here, and uh, it's just one more thing in the stack. So yeah, I mean he's this is in the three minute within three minute. This is part of that three minute call. You know, within three minutes. Okay, minute four starts, and this is the conversation. And this is how he's describing that because he takes over from her description of that three minute call. He does. Hey, one more thing. Yep. Um, sorry about that. But no, I wanted to be sure one thing that struck me about this was mom says within three minutes, well, she first she said, yeah, I, I took a second. Now she mimicked what the interviewer said to her. Did you take a second? Or I don't remember exactly what the interview said, but, but she goes, yeah, I, I took a second and I, I, I looked around or, and, and then, I don't remember her exact words, but within three minutes, she's on the phone with with CP. Well, CP's not there, and so what would we expect Mom to be doing at that point? Would we expect her to call him? How he's how is he going to help? I would. Wh what would you be doing? You would be you'd be on the phone with who? His his friends, his his biological dad. Is he over at your house? Um, running to the neighbors. Did did Sebastian come over here? Looking outside, is, is, is he outside for whatever reason? Did he go to the garage? Did he, all these other things. There's a, I, I can think of like a, a, a list, a laundry list of things that that I would think mom would be doing and places she would be going and people she would be calling to check, not CP who's out of town. Why does she call him? That makes this even more significant. She pulled him into this with that mentioning of a phone call and now he takes over and it's like, we, we did this, we did that. They are united in this, um, but it's, it's not what I would have expected mom to do 
I would expect to hear that I was frantic out of my mind and I did all these things to find Sebastian. And when, when I realized, hey, he's nowhere to be found, I wouldn't be calling CP, I'd be calling the police. Can you get me some help here to find my son? Yeah. And I know, Chris, with if something happened to um, you know, one of our grandkids or or kids when we were younger, uh, you know, I know my wife would be doing <laughs> she'd expect me to be doing things, but she would be taking all these measures herself. And then she would be on the phone calling 911, my child is gone. I could be standing right there. And 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 she would still say, my child, my daughter, my son, whatever is, is missing. And she would take ownership of it. And it, um, just assuming I'm there, but you see what I'm saying, biological mother, there's a, there's a real strength there. And I'm just not getting that sense from her. Yeah, and you know what else to dovetail on your thought there? It, I hate to say this, but it sounds almost like an overlay of what Candace regurgitated. You know, that immediately I called Don. Yeah. Yeah, and in this, you know, summer was gone. I called Don. Well, I the the day I heard that, that was like a huge red flag for me. It was like, well, wait a minute, your your husband's out of town in Don. He happens to be out of town, okay, in this conversation that we're having yeah. here, right? Yeah. It it just happens to be that both men are out of town the day their children go missing. And in this case, step steps son. And yet the the stories are extremely similar the environment's different but they're very similar and and in this situation where you know he starts carrying the conversation here he takes it away from her for a second and then he interjects himself into the narrative of that conversation where yeah you know here we look there etc and i don't i would love to get this tape enhanced to see if he did you know put himself into that uh, search mode uh, with her, but most parents, to your point, mother specifically, they're going to pick up the phone call nine one one. My son's missing. Yeah, you know, I need your help. I my son's missing. You know, okay, well, hang on for a minute. No, hang on, I got to call my husband. Just a second. No, stay on the line, ma'am. Stay on the line. Okay, we have a th- you know people are in route. I'm going to back this up one more time. Here's the mom. Call nine one one. What's going through your mind? She well, we were on the phone and. Then... I was there. I was like, "Is he on the other side of the bed?" We then... see it you now. When you listen to it again, I it sounded like as I was there. Was that I was there on the phone? Was uh, you know, is he present? I don't know. I'm just thinking outside the box here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He may be in the house, you know. And he wasn't. So I was like, "Okay, well, hold on a minute." And immediately after that, we called the sheriff's department and made the report. I ran and... all over the house, outside, inside. Called the sheriff's department and made the report. I, I looked and in every closet. When minutes they were here. They responded within minutes and here we go. So you said you were on the phone. Here we go. Chris, talk, Chris, talk this, connect. this is, this dovetails back into what she said. She, she called CP and she goes, he's, he's, he's nowhere to be found. Like, what did I say before that? Like, what, here we go. We're, we're going to the next step. And, and that's kind of what he just alluded to. Like, oh, here we go. It's, it's it's the next step, and and now they go into all this detail about how many cops were there, and they were all the way down the street. But yet, where was that detail when it came to what she did to find Sebastian? I mean, she she did have this little second thought, you know, like, oh, by the way, I did do all these things, but it wasn't in the beginning. It took a bit for her to, to, for that to come out of her brain, and and we certainly didn't have it when she, she was describing the day and and the the, the evening, all the different things experiential memory, your last moments with, with your, with your son, your left, the last day, those things become very uh, dear to you. And if it's the last day, they know that something happened to them, they disappeared. Um, you remember those last moments, uh, more so than, than the normal day. And so I, I'm not hearing it. It's opposite. Yeah. There's a disconnect here. There's a disconnect. Yeah. Uh, I mean, just, and you know, my circumstance, I mean, when yeah. Karen and I lost our son, I was standing at the teacups with our niece in Disneyland when that phone rang and we got the message that our son had passed from you know the police in an, in an accident. And, and I can tell you that is ingrained here and here. I can tell you exactly what emotions came over me and how they, they flooded my mind, my body. I'm not seeing this 
you know, the, this little boy, 15 year old autistic son, and then they've had eight days now to process this eight days. And, you know, to your point, Steve, I'm not seeing that. It's like, you know, oh, here we go. Let's move. You know, we got yeah. things to move. And he's a former military guy. He's a former Navy guy. So for him, maybe it's like, you know, saddle up, you know, let's move. We got things to do. Could be, could be. And, but, you know, Chris, as you're describing, you, you remembered you were at the teacups when you got that, that news. And I'll bet that what flooded your mind was your last conversations with your son, your last, the last time you were with him. I bet that was like forefront in your mind. Yeah. And And I didn't believe it because I just, he was just at our house, you know, earlier and it's gone you know, to your point. So you're right. I mean, here, I, I'm not, I, it's just, it's like this disconnect. There's a dip, big disconnect here. And, and it's troubling. It is troubling for me too. Call the sheriff's department and made a report. I ran all over the house, outside, inside. I yeah. looked in every closet. Within minutes they were here. They responded within minutes and here we go. So you said you were on the... Well, they didn't respond in minutes, really, did they, Chris? Because you apparently said you phoned at 20 past six. The dispatcher said the call came through at 6.35 or 6.39, something like that. That's like 15, 19 minutes or so before the dispatch call went out. Because the officer said... That was going on about uh, how she wasn't at the house at the time, but she's driving around in a blue, whatever, mini baby blue, whatever. And I said, well, we'll sort out a search plan once we get to the house. So the police wasn't quite there at 6.35 when the dispatch call went out. Where was she? If they got the dispatch call come out at 6.35, they had to be there, what, 640, 645, the latest. So where was she? If she wasn't there when they got there, she wasn't there. And yet Chris told her to get go straight back home. If she said, like the neighbour said, she was only gone 10 minutes, she said she left that house while I was on the phone to the police. Right? So, where was she when Chris said, get, turn around, whatever, get back to the house? The police were on the way. So, what was it? Was it 6.20, 6.30? Because... They found the sheriff's office, but the sheriff's office had to put them through to the dispatch. It has to go through dispatch as well. So they can dispatch out the nearest um, law and police department. Right? So it was set, put through to dis- dispatch. So he said, by going through the sheriff's office, you miss out to all that. Go where you phone the police, you phone the police, and then the police phone, put you through to dispatch, and then dispatch put the call out. Well, they did the same here. It went through to dispatch. So if she was only gone 10 minutes, she'd have been back at the house by half six. Half six, six thirty-five. She'd been there before the police got there, but she wasn't there before the police turned up. So where was she? Phone with her. So you were not home. No, ma'am. Okay. I was. I was at work. I'm a tower crane operator, and I was working in Memphis at the St. Jude Project. So it's, you know, I... she feeds him. The reporters. I wish the reporters would stop feeding. A narrative, just you know, just say where were you and what happened, and let it run. That's what cops do. I mean, a good interviewer, anyway. Yeah. And you you because he he dovetailed right into that conversation. Yeah. yeah. They need. Yeah, to he sure did, and that happens way too often. Um, I wish more people would take training like what I'm my classes and were similar 
and learn to to ask the, the right questions uh, that will that will elicit the information that's very usable. I have an earpiece in that talks to my phone. I have another earpiece in that does the radios. So when she was talking to me, I was like, what? I was confused. We talked about where he could possibly be, and then we went from there and led to calling the cops, and here we are now. And he said it again. He did. Which, yeah, it elevates the sensitivity of that, too. That, to me, that kind of solidified in my mind that that is, in his head, it's, it is more of like, well, on to the next step. It's This is what this is what we talked about. This is going to happen, and, and, and now they're into the next phase. It was rapid fire. They had cars. They, they had cars from here down to the, to the main road, road, as far as I could tell. So what's going through both of their minds? I mean, are we panicking? Is it this? Oh, I think he's. See, she's given them a multiple choice. And the, and ladies and gentlemen, take Steve's class, because that's not how you interview. Well, that's it. You don't yeah. give them multiple this is, choice. This is a news interview, but this is not and a law enforcement interview. Happened, eh? So I would be real curious what they told law enforcement. Eight days earlier. I guarantee oh, you they're I not going to line up. I know what they said to law enforcement sure. eight days earlier. Probably at a neighbor's house, or what are you thinking? My son doesn't run. He's not a runner. He's never run away before. Um, I don't know why. I don't know why he walked out that door. And why is such an emphasis on that door? Why do they want everyone to believe or think he went out that door? Okay, the others were all locked by key. Fair enough. Those doors were still all locked by key, from what she says. We've only got her word. Right? So why the emphasis on that Door. Because I believe he didn't go out any door, not by foot anyway. And that's what I've been looking up today about how, like, how, how, like, how could they move a body if it was unalive and pop it in a car without leaving any DNA? Or any decomp, like the smell, or anything like that. And if you want to know more about that, I'll be doing that tomorrow night. He's a good hold, kid. Hold up, Chris. Let's talk about that just for a second. Uh, I know we got a lot to cover here, but um, she asked him specific. She asked the reporter asked specifically something to the effect of what's going through your mind? Um, are you thinking he's at a neighbor's house? I mean, she offered that possibility to the parents. And what did mom go to? She went to him being a runner. Well, she said, my son's not a runner, but I'm wondering why out of all the possibilities are, are you going to, he's not a runner. And then she says, he's never run away before. There um, in her, it tells me in her mind, there's no other possibility ability other than that he ran away and it's again very similar to summer wells they had their their narrative they had this they already i heard somewhere i can't remember where that apparently sebastian did leave the house one morning right and his mother found him standing at the corner or wherever it was where he waits for the school bus the bus don't come till what, 10 past 7, 20 past 7, something like that. So she had to bring him back home. So it isn't the first time from what I can make out, from what I've heard. I'd like to get it confirmed. That is one of the questions I would ask her if I could. Has your son ever left the house early in the morning to go and catch the school? Bus. You know what I mean? Because if that was the case, I'd be thinking. If my if if I was there, I'd be thinking. Gosh, could he have, could he have left early again to go down to the school bus stop? 
when the bus picks him up. I'd have been going down to that place. I'd have walked down there, anything, a rank, whatever. And then if it wasn't there, then I'd, I'd still be on the phone. But I'd be making my way to these places. And then I'd be coming back home saying, well, he's not at the bus stop, so I don't know where he's gone. He's not in the house, he's not at the bus stop. You know what I mean? So that is the case where he's left the house early before. Could he not have done that again this time? Could this time gone further? But oh yeah, he had no shoes on. Summer Wells' parents knew what happened, that somebody came up on their property and took her. And Chris, you and I, from all our investigations, we know that there's, in a case like this, you don't know. <laughs> you don't know if, did, did Sebastian walk out? Did his dad come and get him? Did, was he lured out by someone else? Did possibly, um, did he, he get internet access that we didn't know about? Um, did he, you know, a friend, uh, did he go to a friend from, from school? Um, you know, there's so many possibilities, but yet they're not getting off that. And so it's, she, she says, I don't know why he walked out that door. So she's telling us that's, that's the only possibility that he walked out that door. There's nothing else on the table. Um, that's, that's the only possibility. And it's just, again, incongruent. It shouldn't be that way. It's not what we expect. Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. DLR, right? Does not look right. Right. Or, or sound right. <laughs> so far. He's not. He's not a mischievous child by any means. Um, but there's answers to questions that have no answers, you know, or questions, excuse me, questions with no answers right now that we are searching for desperately. And we just don't. Is there anything that happened that day? You think back and there might have been a reason he was possibly upset or something else that could have enticed him to go outside. Was there anything that came to mind? We've been combing over that day and even the weeks before he left. And I don't, I haven't been able to figure it out. He's, um, that morning he was laughing, he was joking. Everyone we were around that day agreed that he was even like he was in a good mood, he was behaving. It'd make more sense if we'd been fighting. Or he'd been in trouble. Oh, but he hasn't been in trouble. Okay, right there. <laughs> so um interesting that she's mom says he was in a good mood, he was behaving. Again, a subtle reference to the times that he's not behaving. And I and I get it, you know, he's he's a 15 year old boy and, and, and autistic. And, and I'm sure it's a handful. Um, but when they're missing, it's, it's very common for the negative things to not be at the forefront. They, they take a back seat to all the good things, um, a, a, about the child. And so here she brought it to the forefront. Um, but she said something to the effect of, I don't remember the exact words, but, um, even all, all the people, all, that we know or whatever agreed that he was in a good mood. Let's go back for a second and I'll, I'll replay it for you okay. so we can all hear it one more time. Is that okay? Yeah. Before he left and I don't, I haven't been able to figure it out. He's, um, that morning he was laughing. He was joking. Everyone we were around that day agreed that he seemed like he was in a good mood. He was behaving. It'd make more sense if we'd been fighting. Or he'd been in trouble, but he hasn't been in trouble. Yeah. So, interesting that even all the people that we'd been around agreed that he'd been in a good mood it's that that agreed is is it caught me by surprise actually that means you've been talking to them and and you was he or wasn't he do you, why, why is there why does there have to be an agreement that, that he was in a good mood to me this is more of a narrative building type of situation uh building the narrative that that he was in a good mood that he was happy that's the, the story they're, they're trying to sell, the soggy bread, Chris, that they're trying to sell is that he, he was in such a good mood that he he wouldn't leave on his own. He he wouldn't walk out that door. He's not a runner. You should believe me because even everyone that we were around agreed. So if you didn't believe me before, you should agree now because um, every everyone else agrees that he was in a good mood. You see how they're, they're building that narrative and she's selling it. That's what that is there. And then you have dad or CP uh, saying, um, oh, mom said, it'd make more sense if we'd been fighting, meaning hmm, she brought it up. <laughs> I wonder why, why did she bring that up? And then, and then CP saying, or if he'd been in trouble, 
but he hadn't even been in trouble. And it's just a subtle, subtle reference to, hey, Sebastian gets in, we, we fight sometimes, he fights, or he gets in trouble. And and I know it's, it's minor, but I, it's troubling for me in the context that he's missing. And so I know that when, when the, the kids are missing like this, those negative things take a back seat. And what comes to the forefront is all the good things about them. And, and you're right. This is we, this, like you said, it's a disconnect and it's troubling again, disconnect. Yeah. And in their mind, they're projecting into his mind that good. If, if he gets into trouble here, Oh, well then we could understand him being gone. Good. Yeah, I agree. You know, because what they're doing, right? I mean, they're transferring yeah. everything into Sebastian's mind of, you know, but then they project him as, well, he doesn't get in trouble. But if he did get in trouble, we would understand him being gone here. You know, Chris, now that you say that, um, it, I've been kind of getting the sense here that Sebastian may have got in trouble that night, uh, may have uh, not liked what was going on. There may have been some kind of argument or fight. It, it came out of their brain. They introduced it. Um, and so that may be, may have been the catalyst for, um, for Sebastian. If he walked out that door on his own or they put him out the door, then it's a, it's a form of justification. And those that have guilty knowledge have to have some t most more times than not need to justify it. And this subtle implication or inference that Sebastian got in trouble, got, would fight, would, would misbehave. Those little inferences now are becoming even stronger to me that there's a good chance that that night, that night that she portrayed, that day she portrayed as the normal, um, that he was behaving, I told her I loved you, told my mom, uh, uh, he, he told me that I loved you, I love you, mom. Um, I'm thinking that it's probably, I mean, I'm not 100% there, Chris, but I'm, but I'm pretty close that it was probably just the opposite that night. And there was probably an argument and it's something that, uh, didn't go well. Um, so I still don't know. Did Sebastian walk out on his own? Was he put out? Did, was he taken out? You know, I, I don't know. I can't say that, but, but I'm not liking what I'm hearing here. So, I mean, the million dollar question, why did he go? And the other million dollar question is how? What about social media? Hold on. <laughs> I'm glad I, think I, I stopped it too. Go ahead. That, that might have been should have been your your tagline for this show the, the million dollar question um what as i heard that i thought well the million dollar question is where is he where where is he yeah and but dad he yes, dad's million dollar question or cp's million dollar questions are, are are justification questions well why why did he go and how did he go in his mind it's not there's no question of where is he that really is the million dollar question, but but not to him. It's how can we justify this? That's the million dollar question. Yeah, and the and the shrug, it's like, yeah, man. Yeah, done. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and here we are. Three right. yeah, after the three minute call. Right. You know, here we are. Now they're eight days into well, that's the that's the big question. Yeah, here we go. I don't like it. Yeah, same. I don't like it either. You know, and he wanted to co-contact it, understand he was somewhat of a gamer, or what was he, there was a video game he loved, right? <laughs> Minecraft. Yeah. He loves Minecraft. Um, the the game that he has is not online. He has the the um, Switch. Um, he's, we don't, because of how social media can be, he doesn't have accessibility to communicate with folks on the internet. On internet. I mean, I... We have a firm belief that we just don't feel it right now that he's capable of having that kind of responsibility. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, he, his phone is locked down, his computers, his game, he doesn't have a gamer tag, he doesn't have online capabilities with games. Um, I mean, we've, he, um, we've combed every electronic, every electronic. I mean, we've cooperated with all the authorities as far as anything they've asked us to provide, we've provided. Look, this is a 15 year old lad. He's autistic, I agree. The internet isn't always the best place for any child. Right? But you can set perimeters on your computers or laptops or tablets. You can set perimeters. Right? And with gaming stations like what he was playing, 
His dad said when at his, he never used the headphones. So he couldn't chat to no one because he didn't have the headphones. He could play the game, but he couldn't chat to no one. Right? So, what's the harm in letting a 15-year-old lad go on the computer on his laptop and play a game? You can monitor what he's watching, what he's doing. If you say, right, you can play it, but you have to be in the uh, kitchen or in the living room where we are when you're playing it. Okay? So, we, you know what I mean? So, you can monitor it. Now, I was watching another YouTube channel a video today from a, a few weeks ago, I believe it was. And this YouTuber said that he'd even told his two sons when they were younger. He said, I just want you to know that whatever you do on your phone or on your laptop, I can see exactly what you're doing. Because he had it set up so that he could keep control of it from his own computer. Right? And now, surely they could have done something like that. As I said, that you can set perim perimeters or whatever, guidelines where you can't go into certain sites or do certain things. But they wouldn't even let him do that. He's 15 years old. He's in mainstream school. Right? Where he gets the extra help. He gets extra help. But he's in mainstream school. And he's meeting people, other kids there who are playing these games and he can't play them because he can't get on the internet. Now I think that might be a big issue in a household with a 15 year old as well. Just saying. That's an interesting statement. We've yeah. cooperated with all the author authorities as far as. Yeah. Everything they've asked, well, okay. I was going to have you stop it there too. I'm glad you stopped. Because it's, it's a, it's, he qualified it, just like you said, as far as. But did that even need to be stated that we've cooperated with authorities? This is your child. Why? <laughs> we all assume that you're cooperating. That only begs the question, what are you hiding? What, why, why even introduce the possibility? Of it's like that last press interview, the law enforcement and TBI done. TBI said, at the beginning, that is very cooperative. That is very cooperative at the beginning. Okay, so are you telling us now that they're not cooperating? That they're not talking to you? You know what I mean? You have to listen to what the word says. And sometimes I don't catch it straight away, but I normally catch it, say, it's on the second or even the third time I watch it. But I do catch it. But little things on here that I've noticed... Like the shrugging of the shoulder and that shaking of the head. Even though it was only slight and it was only for a split second, he shook his head like that. When he's saying something that was supposed to be very positive, he should have been going up and down. Right? But he was going, I agree, yes, but going left to right, so no. His body was telling you one thing, his words were telling you another. There wasn't co... It wasn't working together. The words that was coming out of the mouth was not working with his body reaction. If you understand what I mean. Of, of a lack of cooperation. Why, why do you need to say that? It's, it's not necessary to say. We just expect. You're cooperating. Of course you're cooperating. No one would thought to ask. And now we're asking, wait a minute. That's a head scratcher. Is there a possibility you're not fully cooperating? And now we look, you break it down even further. Like, well, you just qualified your cooperation as far as. So it begs the question, are you hiding something? Well, and that's a, to dovetail into your thought. It's interesting. They go from what the likes are of the Sebastian. He likes to play Twitch to we're cooperating with the authorities. I mean, it's almost like this 
you know, he jumped into a different train track immediately to tell everybody, well, we've let them have access to all of the um, information in their, you know, our computers and his computer, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but what's interesting is the authorities have said that not everyone, nobody's been cleared. And that in, unfortunately includes, includes them. And they said that at the two month mark. So maybe that's where the concept of as far as uh, has a little more weight and a little more power. Maybe there's other things that there hasn't been a lot of help with. I don't know. I mean, I just, I'm just, mm -hmm. right. I mean, you've been in this situation a hundred times where we've talked to folks that have said A, B, C, and D, and it's, it's E, F, and G. And you go, yeah, right. I'm not buying that yet. You know? This is actually a, the, the fact that he said that is a statement to portray himself in a good light. Why do you, why does he need to portray himself in a good light in this situation? Again, that is unexpected, and it's something that we often see in situations where we hear that from people that that are that have some guilty knowledge in the in the situation. He shouldn't have be having to portray himself in a good light. Mom shouldn't have to be portraying herself as a good mom. You see, it's so this is we're seeing a pattern here, and I think it's going to continue on. A uh, hundred bucks says you uh, clip this and, and into your clashes. <laughs> I'm not going to take that bet because yeah. <laughs> all right hang on here we go still just don't have any answers did he have any friends that could have possibly contacted him in some way on his phone all his friends at school have been questioned to my knowledge and none of them knew anything with this big question mark he's vanished yes ma'am no i can figure out where or why um all right so let's talk to you about the relationship involved because they're the biological father is very much involved in Sebastian's life as well. Yes, ma'am. Very much. Right. Um, and and how would you describe that relationship, the two of them and the four of you? It's relatively good. I mean, we talk regularly. He talks to his son on a regular basis, sees him on a regular basis. He's involved in school and therapy. And um, I mean, he doesn't have any extracurricular activities, but I can tell you now, if he did, his dad would be in the front row. Um, in two different households and the communication between the three of us is is great i mean yes we're just like every parent we all have our disagreements but in the end we come together as a team and we work and we come up with solutions <coughs> as we best see fit i mean he's i'm mean, almost in contact with him almost almost yeah is he talking about biological dad or yeah Sebastian, the biological he's talking dad. about the father yeah and, and which is an interesting description there because he's letting her talk, which is good, right? Because, you yeah. know, her, her ex, uh, yet, you know, he kind of colors, he colors in, you know, number five on the painting, you know, with blue, right. Every, everything's great. You know, use, you know, paint number five, everything's perfect. But, you know, later on, it just unravels. I mean, the two are ready to strangle one another. Well, and again, this is a continuation of of him portraying himself as as a, a good guy. Um, I, I communicate with him almost daily. It's it's more of that portrayal, and and you know, and I I get it. I'm going to give him a break, you know, because I, I want I, I want to hear about good relationship, but uh, it needs to still be contextual, and still um, I, I want to hear hear more things. But um, most of what I'm hearing is is CP. Um, Kind of like rehabbing himself if you will for whatever reason maybe he's been lamb blasted a little bit in the media up to this point i don't know but um he has a need to portray himself as a good guy which is again troubling you shouldn't have to do that yeah they the, the whole clarity of focus to your point should be on sebastian i mean we're what the right. heck is going on here there's not this you know eight days later you know it's almost as if it's like you know okay i mean eight days later and you know, and I've in our situation, and I only speak from personal experience of I can't believe this. This can't be happening. Right. It's like this fog of life, you know, and and here it's like, yeah, you know, all of his friends have been interviewed, nothing. We turned over, I you know, blah, blah, blah. I don't know. I'm I love the soggy bread that's I'm not buying any <laughs> soggy bread right now. Right. I think we have a soggy bread emoji too, everybody. <laughs> um, let's talk about Sebastian. And she keeps feeding them a narrative. She, yeah. 
reporter. I and I don't know if she's doing it because she's sensing that she's not getting the right information, or if she's doing it to try to save the interview. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I would love to talk to her about that, but she's definitely feeding them. And it's so she and she's adding a, a, a level of contamination to to their answers. But yet, even with that contamination, we're still getting some great information as far as as far as finding out what's going on inside their brain, uh, what's up there. But yeah, in, in a, a, a good interviewer should not be feeding it's something not, that law enforcement should never do. I get it a little bit more when it's media and they have to keep things going. Um, make the show, you know, the interview a little sexy, if you will, um, appealing. Um, and so she's trying to save it, I think. But I get the sense that she's not hearing what she wants to hear from parents of uh, an autistic child that's missing. So Ava says that she lives in the neighborhood. I, I don't have a confirmation on that, but I believe you, Ava, if that's what you say. Uh, that would be also interesting. But here, here's the good news is they were interviewed by the police long before the uh, reporter so hopefully they've they're taking notes yeah Which, for sure about sebastian how would you describe him sweet stubborn <laughs> um he loves to help he loves uh running and he loves to play his games and his fidgets and um uno lord that's one of his favorite games right now um favorite color is green um do you want music Oh, God, um, he loves music. An eclectic taste. Probably an eclectic. Me. I mean, from, as, as everybody knows, Eye of the Tiger to Eddie Vedder. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So we got we got Pearl Jam on one hand. We've got Sabira on the other over here. We've got Taylor Swift. and uh, He's got a big crush on her. <laughs> um, I mean, country, rock, no classic. We don't, we don't allow the hip-hop. Well, he, he doesn't really well, get into it anyways. Things, I mean, you mentioned he loved running. So... Did he love the outdoors at all? I mean, would something outside that was somewhat outdoorsy be enticing so, him or pull him outdoors? He loves, like, when, um, when we were in California and the school had this lap thing to gain money. It was a fundraiser. And every year he was, I did this many laps. I did this many laps. I mean, I've got T-shirts where they would ride on his back. Every time the kids went around, they'd mark the mark on the back and they'd keep running. And he just had marks all the way across his back. Um he likes playgrounds. Um, he hates oh, yeah. being dirty. He, he don't like being dirty. dirty. Yeah, he's not a, he's not your tomboy style child where he goes outside and plays in the mud. He loves animals, but he's terrified <laughs> of bugs. Oh yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. I mean, yeah. even a fly, and he's like, oh. <laughs> I saw too because he's highly functioning. I think you all have described him as having a form of autism. He does. But just describe that to our viewers too, as far as his way of thinking of things and maybe how determined he was about certain things or his mindset. He, um, <laughs> he, he's got a stubborn mindset. If he believes it's this, he gets on a one man track and he is just yeah. on it and he is all about it. <laughs> um, but I mean, he's, he's very, did you notice how she mirrored his action thing? When he put his hands out and he said, he goes that way. She done the same thing. That was brought up in another interview. With someone else, I can't remember now. Um, Very smart. I mean, he, he can play chess. He he can beat adults in chess. So wow. he's he loves he loves 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 playing games. What about navigation? Like, did he have a sense of direction? Do you think he could have possibly even hitched a ride or gotten a ride on a bus or some sort of transportation? That is a speculation that we don't have an answer for. Just directionally, he knows he could guide you from our house to his dad's house. Yeah. He could get from like this house. I think he can make it up to Culver's ice cream. He can go to Culver's. Oh, boy, loves he knows malt. where Culver's <laughs> is because Culver's has malt. Uh -huh. He loves malt, extra malt. Yeah. Every time, extra malt. Now, how far away does his dad live? Clarksville. His dad lives up by Clarksville. So he could guide someone all the way to Clarksville. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Have a pretty keen sense of direction, at least with certain things. Uh, if, familiar routes. Yes. Familiar routes. Okay. Familiar routes. I and mean, if I took him another route, knowing this way, he would not know it. He goes up there so often that he knows he knows how to get to his daddy. We know that. His dad works <coughs> as far as well. We're going this way, we're going that way, and mm -hmm. keep the same thing, and it works out. So, um, let's talk to you because earlier, Chris, you and I were talking, and you were saying that there are a lot of people. 
who are harassing both of you. What, if any of that, do you want to address? What, what do you want to say to any of these people? Just that you don't know, and I don't wish you to ever know. <coughs> I would say it like this. Everybody has an opinion, you know, it, and it's perfectly okay to have that opinion, but you're not in the situation. You don't quite understand. Um, I wish people would step back, take a different wide open view and not assume what they know. It's just better to stick to the facts. If they have questions, all they have to do is ask. Hey, Chris, that's, I don't know, the fourth or fifth time, I, I think that she said, you know, like something effective, I, I hope or pray that nobody ever has to go through this. And um, again, I, I, we've kind of talked about this before, but it is focused on herself and not Sebastian and what he's going through. So it's just, that's kind of like, um, because she, she keeps repeating it, it's to me, that is what she has in her head is is what is the soggy bread that, that people are gonna buy, the reporter's gonna buy, it's gonna sell her emotion. And so she keeps repeating it, but it's still, it's void of, of what Sebastian is experiencing. I still haven't heard that. I've heard some things that, that he's, you know, that he liked and his music and all these, the things that he liked um, likes and, 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 but not what they're feeling about him at this current time and what he's experiencing at this current time. I have, still haven't heard any of that. And that's exactly what we should be hearing from, you know, de facto innocent parents. Well, and, and I, I agree with you a thousand percent because what they're doing is they're buying empathy from the story Yeah. to the community. I, it's, it's like, I mean, how many times have we had that guy walk in, you know, with a buddy and say, you know, Hank, we'll wait here. I'm going to go talk to the detectives. And then in the middle of the interview, they turn, the Hank says, uh, or the interviewee turns and says, well, if you don't believe me, go ask Hank. He's, right. in, the, he's in the living room. And so what, so what he's doing, what they're, I, and just my opinion at this point, she's buying empathy to everybody watching this story to say, you see, there's nothing, nothing to see here. Nothing to see here. Move along. Everything is cool. But to your point, what she's not doing is, my son left the house without his shoes. He's on the scale, the spectrum. He has autism. I'm just afraid. I'm scared what he may be experiencing. I don't know how to deal with this. You know, and that is the emotion that you get when it's more in line with, you know, the car on the right side of the road and there's no line for the collision. For sure. Good way to put it. Again, and once again, very similar to what we heard in the Summer Wells case. Almost verbatim. I mean, it was, it, it's it's kind of scary, to be honest with you. I, and I know this is going to sound crazy, and I'm sure the trolls will take it. I'm wondering if they watch some of that. <laughs> you know? I was thinking that earlier. I was wondering that People same thing. That. I just didn't say it. People but, be but I, I wanted, wanted the same thing. Don't you would think if they watched don't. some of that, that they would have learned how not to do things. But, you know, human nature is a is a funny thing in that, even even people that well let's say it, I'll, I'll, I'll mention this once in a while in my classes that i'm teaching you about detecting deception and other information in the language and even though those that learn how to detect deception they can't stop it in themselves so even someone that's trained they go out and commit a crime they some kind of infraction or, or whatever and then they're questioned about it because that human nature is so um it's so strong in the way the brain works that the same thing is going to come out of their mouth. They're going to give away all the same clues of deception. They're going to say all the same things that, and those, as, as the people that they've been studying how to detect deception, you can't stop it. It's just the way that the brain works. And so here we go. It's a, even if they have studied it, they can't change it. They can't change the narrative. They don't know how to. Yeah. And, and, and very few do. And, and it's very difficult to actually change the story enough to make it believable. They can't do it. Oh, here's an interesting comment. Uh, in their very last YouTube interview, few days, they mentioned summer many times. Oh, well, no kidding. Wouldn't that be interesting, right? Wow. It, I wonder what the context is. Is it, you know, and they went through it too? Uh, let's see here. Katie elbows Chris when he's talking about bio, bio father. Yeah, interesting. Huh. We all love Sebastian. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's keep moving here. Let's go. Just be kind to people. I mean, that's... It's real simple. 
There are some people who have been talking because I know this is part of the harassment. Um, is there anything you want to address about this child custody situation? The previous. So I have a, a current case that is going ongoing in another state. Um, we requested that case to be sealed because there are some individuals who have taken upon themselves to put stuff out there that they don't quite know, which all they have to do is ask, I'll tell you. Um, but because of that, you know, it's, it has nothing to do with our son. It has nothing to do with the situation. You know, it, I just people with their... I've got a question for you, uh, CP. What happened over the Christmas period when you had Faith and Sebastian was at his father's? What happened for for the time when Faith went back home after Christmas and straight away in the new year, once the courts and everything was open, she went in and put a, a, mo a, a, court, a filed a motion for temporary or some custody, something like that, to stop you from getting visiting rights. Because Faith had gone home, she's only six, but they go home and they will tell the mother what happens, what they did, where they went, what was said. So what happened over the Christmas period for Nina, your ex-wife, to go and put that court motion in at the courts? Was it something Sebastian told her on one of his live uh, video calls or phone calls that he had with her? Is that Seth said he'd be on the phone for hours with her talking. So did he say something to her? Did you not like the fact that she was on the phone to Sebastian? Did you say something to her afterwards? So what happened, Chris, over the Christmas period? Answer me that. Respect that, and then keep an open mind. It's Hi, Subaru totally Steve. Is Sebastian is it able to watch this? And maybe he's watching this as it airs. And if he is, what do you want to say to Sebastian? What do you want him to hear from you right now? Oh, gosh. That we love you so much. I, look at the way he's looking. Mm. Down and to the left. The, well, and this, this comes well, after the heels of that conversation. It's it's almost like bleed over stress, you know, on the CVSA. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Where he had just talked about the custody problem from another situation. And now she's going to talk about, you know, that one of the things I think it's, we'll, we'll tell the audience, when you do a CVSA, it's computer voice stress analysis. Uh, it comes out looking like a block or like a Christmas tree. And on the second question, which would be an honest answer, is your name Chris McDonough? If you're still thinking about the other question that was just stressful, it'll also come out like a block. So it just, we call that bleed over. Uh, and I think this, he's kind of like, I didn't like that question now that it's out there. And she's going to pick up on Sebastian here. Yeah. Chris, hold on though. There's something very important though. Yeah, I missed it. This is biological mom, and, and <laughs> reporter just asked, "What do you want to say to Sebastian? What do you want him to hear if he watches this?" Now, remember when I referred back to what my wife would say when she, if she something happened, and she would say, "My daughter is missing. My granddaughter is missing. My grandson. Some it would be my. She would take ownership." Well, um, listen to what what she said. She didn't say to Sebastian, "Sebastian, I love you." She included CP. She said, we love you. And it's a, what this is, is uh, it's something that I don't expect to hear from biological mom. I want, bi I want bio mom to say, honey, I love you and come back and, 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 you know, loving mom. And he's going to come home to loving mom, but she is aligning herself with CP, with her husband. And he's the stepdad. And I'm not quite sure why she's doing that. But for whatever reason, she needs to associate herself with him. And it takes me all the way back to the phone call, the phone call in the morning right away called called my husband. Um, and the night before she when she skipped over time, she goes and a little while later, I, I wound up going to bed. Well, in that time, she had a three hour phone call with with CP. 
she's on the phone with him a lot during this situation and instead of finding um, Sebastian. And here again, she's, I don't know exactly if she's, why she's aligning with him other than if what I'm hearing in her language is correct, that she has, there's, there's that disconnect, which kind of which indicates, not kind of, but it does indicate some kind of guilty knowledge on her part. Um, she likes, she, she doesn't want to be in this alone. It's like she's grabbing him, like linguistically, psychologically, she's grabbing him, like we're in this together. We love you. She's using that we, and it's it's a very strong pronoun. She's she's unifying herself with him at that point in time. Interesting. Okay, I'm gonna play. I'm gonna go back just for a second and play that through. Like, I I missed that completely, but you're spot on on this. It's interesting. Totally different. Is Sebastian is it able to watch this? Maybe he's watching this as it airs. And if he is, what do you want to say to Sebastian? What do you want him to hear from you right now? Oh, gosh. That we love you so much, and we want you to come home, and you're not in trouble. I guarantee you he is loved. And trust me, the open arms are waiting for him from every parent to every family member to probably everyone in the community. But there's no malice that we just want our boy home. Huh. So somehow we missed the the we thing again, but but what he just said there, it struck me too. Is why why does he have to guarantee that he's loved? That's that that's more of that language. that's there to convince. It's like, well, of course he's loved. We expect him to be loved. Why, why do you, why CP? Why do you have to guarantee that he's loved? That's just all that does is it it begs the question: Is he really not loved? That you now have to go out of your way and and and, and exert this energy and this, the, the, the words to convince us that he's loved. It's to me, it's an indication of something that I would hear from parents that are either abusive or neglectful or, or I should, or a parent that is abusive or neglectful. It came, it came out of his mouth. Um, so it's, yeah, I'm just thinking that, yeah, I don't think that he really loves Sebastian. I guarantee that he's loved. I just, it, it for me, it just, it screams out, oh, there's a good chance that he's not, He's not loved. And on top of that, everything that came before this, Chris, him portraying himself as the good guy, uh, mom being in self-preservation mode, portraying herself as a good mom. This all is leading towards, um, it's it's stacking and and shaping into the language of parents that are uh, either neglected, neglectful or abusive. Yeah, remember in high school where you'd go, yeah, sure, right? I love that part where this is such a serious question about what do you want if he's listening and the response is you know i love this part hang on yes yeah, no sense i'm going to go back a little bit more real fast who's ask i'll tell you um but because of that you know it's it has nothing to do with our son it has nothing to do with the situation you know the old um what was the movie where so there's a chance then with um what's it saying dumb and dumber so oh right yeah we, we what are the odds if we can go out right? uh, zero so there's a chance <laughs> just it, the shoulder shrug. Shrug. keep an open mind it's totally different is sebastian is it able to watch this maybe he's watching this as it airs and if he is, what do you want to say to Sebastian? What do you want him to hear from you right now? Oh, gosh. That we love you so much. And we want you to come home and you're not in trouble. I guarantee you. He right there. And trust me, the open arms are waiting mm. for him to come home. Yeah, I miss every that. Parent to every family member, to probably everyone in the community. But there's no malice that we just want. Our boy. Well, I mean, he, why such the qualifications, Steve? I mean, love, malice, you're not in trouble. I mean, those are three negatives Yeah. to something he's asked about a positive. What do you want him to hear? Okay. And she gives three negatives. You're not in trouble, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. What, what's your take on that? Is that that's what you were saying a couple yeah, of minutes? That's exactly what I was saying. And it's, it's more indicative of, of uh, abuse. A, a abusive, uh, abusing Sebastian in some way, 
Um, and and be thinking also on now in those terms, they brought up. I guess this, this is the second time now, and, and I can understand saying, "Hey, honey, you're not in trouble. Just we just want you home." I I, I get that. But when you have this in the context that with all these other things, it begs a different context. And and it's more the, the language of abuse than it is of we love you, we just want you to come home. It's not that. It's not, we're not that if that was the case, we'd hear it throughout in all their language and we're, and we're not hearing it. What we're hearing is no, uh, all these other things that are coming up. And it, for me, as I'm hearing the context of this, it's like, wait a minute, did he get in trouble? Did he do something he wasn't supposed to do? And, and there's some kind of malice and there's um, some, was there some kind of a, abusive situation that went on is, which I could see that would be why Sebastian might run, why they might know, because in their head, it's like, they know he went out that door. Um, was he, but, but I don't know that Sebastian would go out that door on his own. So did they, was there some kind of punishment? Was that part of the conversation the night before when she's on the phone with CP for the three hours is, um, and I'm, cause I know already that it's probably, probably was not the normal day. She doesn't really remember those she's she can't articulate linguistically the what happened during that normal day all of all those things that you would remember the last moments she can't articulate those things why because she doesn't they're the things that you it's opposite of a loving situation the opposite of a, a normal day um <laughs> instead she's trying to convince that it was and so i'm wondering now was there something some kind of mm, that she, the cp tell her hey do this to to quell the situation quell the make him behave and uh I, you know i don't know it's just pure speculation on my point on, on my part at this point but that certainly would be a reason for could be a reason for sebastian leaving it, it's it, there was something abusive going on there and I, when i say abusive i mean i don't know there's different levels of abuse and, it, and for a, a, a child with autism it might only take a minor a minor incident of abuse that makes him think yeah, i'm not staying here i'm you know to be for afraid enough that that he, he goes out the door despite, but I don't think I, in my mind, as I'd say that, I'm like, no, I don't think he would do that because he's, he's afraid of the dark. He's, he, he doesn't like being dirty. He's going out without his shoes. He's afraid of bugs. Um, that doesn't make sense. So if he went out the door and I'm, and I'm pretty certain it happened at night, not in the morning, it was, it was night. Um, when she's saying, he told me he loved me. That's probably the time that, that he went out that door, whether she put him out the door to make him learn a lesson or well, I'm not quite sure, but the, it's shaping up to be in something like that. That's kind of what the language is 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 saying. Well, I mean, how many times in patrol would you roll up on a call like this, and if it's a runaway, 15 year old runaway, right? And you get there, and the first thing you hear the parents or the mother say is, "I uh, he we got in a fight last night, um, and he's gone. He's I, I don't know what I mean, did I do something? You know, and you hear this self loathing guilt and yeah. blame that right. the child left the house." You know, and in this case, you know, that's not what's happening here. She's she's now reiterating, you know, as a final or a really important statement, she's given the opportunity, what do you want him to hear? And she relays these three negatives. You're, you know, this and that, and you're not in trouble. And it's like, man, I hope the I hope TBI, I really hope that she said to TBI in the very beginning, like we just talked about there for a moment, that, you know, hey. At 10 o'clock, I heard a thump. You know, I went to check him at, you know, 6 a.m., yada, yada. And I'm not, not going to give him any more clues because they're going to adapt to it uh, in after this call here or this uh, All show here this evening. I know yeah, they will. Interview. And that's that's every the norm. Interview. And yeah. also the other thing, too, is you mentioned that she heard a thump at 10, 10 p.m. Um, it's interesting because it's very, very common for a guilty mind to incorporate some portion of of the crime and to put themselves at a, at at the scene to put themselves on the road uh to put themselves to, uh they heard that and it's more times than not it's something that it was spoken or heard but or seen i'm sorry seen or heard and and this is the, the she heard something and i can't tell you how many times that the a guilty mind has linguistically then put themselves in the moment of the crime by saying i heard something or I saw something. Yeah. Uh, so I think that that's what's going on there. That that 10 o'clock time frame is, I think, going to be pretty key. You know, I'm, um, are you, I'm leaning more towards, you know, I'm not going to give an opinion yet, but I'm, I'm leaning more towards the mom than the stepdad here for a moment. Not that I'm saying, you know, not that they couldn't have done, I think she could have done something independent of him. 
at this point. And if I was investigating this case, my opinion would be at this point, I'm going to really focus on mom for a minute here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe he gets the phone call. Maybe he did get a phone call, just kind of like, you know, the other situation. And now they're, they're building up. What's going to be interesting is see the relationship dynamics, because these types of cases like this, unlike Summer's case, and I think you would agree, Steve, a child you know, of, of that age, four or five, versus a 15-year-old. Because in three years, let's push it where Summer's at, and, you know, even today, in three years, he would be 18. And so that narrative is going to be a lot more difficult to control because he's going to show up somewhere, somewhere in the environment, social, you know, whatever. Because once he hits 18, the law says you're an adult. So they only have three years to play a game if they're going to play a game yeah and they need to be thinking about that because that's going to determine how much pressure is going to be on the two of them for the next three years in terms of their relationship if they split uh i'd go right to chris and say you know let's talk let's that, talk yeah that, that would be the best thing for this case actually um but i agree with you that and i i haven't made it any I don't have a firm opinion on this, but I agree that mom should be looked at, but I can't get away from the history of abuse on CP's part. Yeah. And if if there is abuse going on here, very good chance that that mom Katie is being abused in some way, even if it's verbal, um, mind control, you know, um, uh, codependent on Chris in some way. I mean, how many cases have we seen where a mom or girlfriend or somebody will do something because the the spouse or the significant other is making them do it or they're afraid of what the spouse will do if they don't do this or they've been given the ultimatum that well talking about look at adam montgomery right with his wife yeah i said this before when Adam, the father, was take being abusive towards Harmony, hitting at, beating at, giving her black eyes, bruises, you name it, right? She was fine with that. She was okay with that. But then, after Harmony had died, had died, right? He then turned his aggression onto her. And that's when she didn't like it. And that's when she finally got the courage to walk out, to get out of there. Right? And leave him. And take her two kids with her and leave him. What's a possibility that now Sebastian isn't around, who's he going to take his anger out on? And will they split? Will they separate? And if they do, will she talk or will he talk? Right? Personally, I hope she talks. And I think she's involved with whatever has happened to Sebastian. One way or the other, whether he walked out because of whatever. But she was the only one there to... If he was scared of his life, for his life, and he walked out that way or rang out that house, then he was scared of his mother because she was the only one there. Right? So... If she come through afterwards and said, look, this is what happened. And I was scared to say anything because see, see, Chris was making me, you know what I mean? I think she needs to do some time. But he's the one who's been doing the main bulk of the punishment. Right? But it all depends if they ever find a body, if they ever find him, 
if he's alive or I hope to God he's just rang off somewhere and he's alive. And I hope to God because he's rang off that the dogs that they had in were pathetic. They couldn't even do the job right. Right, but I don't want to say that because that's putting law enforcement's dog handlers down. And I know they work hard with their dogs. Right? So I don't want to think that. But how else could you have left that house without leaving any scent, any sign, any clues of him anywhere? Right? You couldn't have. They could have found some clues by now. That I'm going to leave you if if he doesn't if Sebastian doesn't leave the relationship if he doesn't find another home if he doesn't if he if he stays here then I'm gone and and you know that's not uncommon and so either way it needs to be focused on on mom here but the reasons why could be because of what she's experiencing in her relationship with CP just yeah, speculation great point but uh, a la Chris watch you know with the girlfriend yeah the family goes or I go. Yeah. Susan Smith. Susan Smith. Susan Smith. Yeah. Yeah. Susan. There's there's a lot of there's a lot of cases like that. Yeah. That's a great point. She's coming up for parole. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but that mama's heart. I know it's daddy's too. But I feel like there's always that extra special bond. Can you walk us through what you're thinking right now? I just want my baby to be okay. I don't know where he's at. I don't know where he's at. Now, I don't know if I'm mm. seeing this in my mind, but it, did that reporter sound like she was tearing up, you know, a special bond with mom? Yeah. And, and, you know, is that is that going to be an emotional mirroring, you know, that she that Katie's going to pick up on here? Well, it it could be. I mean, there's definitely cannot take that off the table. And that certainly is, it kind of depends on, on Katie's personality is she one that is she one that um tears up easily is does she you know when she feels emotion does she tear up it i mean i know people that don't tear up to save their life you know never um but yet yeah, can be very express emotion but they don't you don't see it in them so it, it could be it kind of just depends on her her personality there um but i uh, along those lines and what she just said interesting that that why are the words why did she choose the word out of all the things that she could have said at that point in time is I don't know where he is. I don't know where he is. And she repeated it. I don't know where he is. Um, I, I've, I had a, I have a couple other cases that I often profile in my classes where that same verbiage was used. And, and it one in particular by a, a, a fiance, uh, a guy that killed his fiance. She was pregnant with his baby. And, and he was asked in a press conference, um, describe your last moments with your fiance. And he said, he paused for a long period of time and he said, I don't know where she is. I'm <laughs> just like, it's like the, the telltale heart, that old Edgar Allan Poe story, telltale heart. It just so much guilt that it's just, that's just what comes out and what, what's just pressing on their mind, you know, that what they do know. And it comes, uh, I don't know where he is. And I, anyway, it reminded me of that. And I just, so, you know, with everything else that we've seen in this case, I just wonder, does she know? Does she know what happened to him? But I feel like there's always that extra special bond. Can you walk us through what you're thinking right now? I just want my baby to be okay. I don't know where he's at. I don't know where he's at. Let's talk about the community because I want you all to know. Even, even my church body, I mean, we're all praying, we're all praying for his safe return quickly. What do you all want to say to the community? With everything from the bottom of our hearts, we, I would not have imagined how far this has gotten, but there's no way to repay the gratitude, the love that we've felt from the community. No, CP, because you was hoping that law enforcement, and that, as I keep saying, law enforcement would have gone with this as a runaway. Except for one person that got in the way of that. And that person is called Seth. Seth wasn't having none of that. He 
He knew his son would phone him if he ran away, but he didn't take his phone, did he? What child runs away and not takes a flipping phone or money? And even better, shoes. You're going to do the prayers, but thank you. But don't stop yeah, Please. My son is somewhere. Just say no until he's home. As far as I know, they're doing everything. Anything and everything has been an option. They have brought in assets and resources from various counties, potentially other states. I mean, I don't know how much more they could do, but we're grateful for everything they have done. They're amazing. I just still haven't got my baby back. They will. They will. Hey, Chris, just to, I like that. I, I like what she said because. I was going to stop you earlier and I didn't when she asked, what do you want to say to the community? And she said, thank you. And he said, and CP said something that was kind of like, um, we can't ever repay you for what you've done. And a lot like, kind of like it's over. But, but I, I was thinking, Oh, you know, the community hasn't found him. There's, there's still more to do. I would be saying to the community, man, just keep looking, just please keep looking. Um, I appreciate everything, all your, all, everything you've done. But instead it's like, they're, they're thanking him for their support, not, for what they've done to look it's more of hey thanks for supporting us with your love and your prayers and and i and i get that but i but i want to hear more hey keep uh, thank you for looking and just keep it up and and i know as a, as, as her second thought she did come out and she say oh and don't stop looking but to to um what she did say here i really liked it she said she wasn't too keen on the police she says they still haven't found my baby i like that that's what I, that's the language i want to hear throughout this whole thing is like why haven't they found him? Why? Ha I, I like that. Um, and then CP's like, did he shrug again? I'm not quite sure, but he's like, they will. He's, he's, he's reassuring her. I just, I mean, I don't want to be totally negative through this whole thing because that, that actually was something I would, I like to hear. So kudos to her. Okay. He's out there somewhere. So it's basically, it's one day at a time, getting through this and bringing him home. Yeah. What is the reaction to the fact that somehow he, his, his image he hasn't captured on any video. I know that it was very dark that night. I mean, it gets dark around here at night in general, but um, so far we haven't found him on any camera footage to prove where he's at. Or oh. that, that statement's always bothered me. Yeah. To prove where he's at. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, why do you have to prove where he's at? to the authorities because the authorities are asking them, you know how it goes. Correct. They're saying, where is he? This, that statement reminds me of, again, another uh, example I use in my class is there's a, a guy that was stabbed. He was with some, he was with a couple of friends in their apartment. They were doing a lot of dope and drinking and stuff. And a couple of them got in an argument and one of them was stabbed. And, and in his statement, he survived but he went to the hospital and he got a lot of stitches and staples and everything. And, and, but he skewed his story instead of he's actually the one that started the fight. And in his story, he left all that out and just wanted me to believe that, that the guy just got up and stabbed him for no reason, just started beating on him and stabbed him for no reason. And that was totally, the case was totally opposite of that. And in his story, he said, um, yeah, he just started beating me down with, with, with no regret and just over and over and over. And he got a knife and, and, he, and he stabbed me. And, and I had the cuts to prove it and the staples to prove it in my neck. And I was like, why does my victim have to prove anything to me? He shouldn't have to prove anything to me. And, and it's because he was changing the narrative. He, was, he actually was stabbed, but he was deceptive in the way that he was portraying it, leaving out all of his own culpability. And so when I, anytime I hear this from our alleged victim's family to prove where he was, I'm like, ah, I'm just like you. I'm just like, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, it catches us off guard. Like, why do you have to prove anything? Why does it have to be proof? And it, and I wonder, was is this? Did she hear something from the investigators regarding proof of life? Um, 
you know, is he on camera? Is he on a video somewhere? Um, you know, this proof of life, did they ask her for pictures from her cell phone that she might've taken that day of him? Or, I, you know, I don't know. There's cause all kinds of. Well, we know Seth had been asking for proof of life from, from the beginning. It took him, what, six weeks to show him a video of Sebastian leaving the steakhouse. Right? We also know they wanted any ring doorbell, any home security video from the Sunday afternoon. Right? So, like, I don't know. Because he was out, wasn't he, all day, Sunday till 6.30. So, I think that's when there's warning proof of video was from, like, 6.30 onwards. Because he was out all day. So, they had an idea of where he'd been in the daytime. So, but they weren't sure... Hold on, I've just got to move my cat. So they weren't sure themselves if he actually come home. And that's what I mean. Possibilities, but I wonder, is she, is she parroting language that she heard from them? Because that would be proof of life um, that he was alive earlier, uh, you know, that, that night, I guess, earlier, not... She went to find him in the morning. He wasn't there. So you see where I'm going with this. And it goes into your thought. It goes into your thought. I mean, first of all, there's not a lot of whole, this is eight days into the investigation. So there's not a whole lot of social media, you know, trolls coming in and saying, you guys are, you did it. You're the ones, we know you killed him, yada, yada. Now there is some of that. I'm sure of it. Like everything, like every case that ever happens. But that statement in of itself is not directed at if if it's directed at social media it goes exactly to your point they're more concerned with what they're thinking than they are about sebastian okay most people will you know in a scenario where there's no jeopardy will say i could care less what they think i'm looking for my son you know where you hear that you hear it from the biological father mm -hmm. that's what the biological father is the first one that says i don't care what they say I want to find my son, Sebastian. Okay? And, you know, the, the fact that she says to prove, I think that's directed at law enforcement, and that was kind of a, a leakage. Yeah. You know, I think LE put a little pressure on them saying, look, you know, this isn't lining up. Do you have any video? And by the way, she works for, for Brinks, so she's a, a, a video expert. She installs cameras and that kind of stuff. So, of course, they're going to press her right up front going, hey, you do this for a living do you have any video? Do you have anything other than what you're saying? Is there mm -hmm. something? Uh, and then, you know, the, she chooses those words very succinctly. I'm going to go back and play it one more time. Hold on. I know that it was very dark that night. How does she know it's dark? She, she's in bed. He's in bed. She doesn't go check on it until six in the morning. Yeah. I mean, it gets dark around here at night in general, but. Um... It gets dark around here at night in general. Okay, it gets dark everywhere. That's another reason when I heard that, I thought, oh, that's, that's just another check mark that this, whatever happened, occurred that night. Uh, not, And I would say of that 10 o'clock hour again, that's going to be probably key. That's probably about the time. The thump. The thump. So far, we haven't found him on any camera footage to prove where he's at or where he's gone. So far, we haven't found him on any camera footage to prove where he's at, where he's gone. So it sounds like they're alleging there is camera footage that they reviewed. Or, well, yeah, that's a good possibility. Yeah, that's good. Um, or in their mind, they're thinking there's a possibility. Now that they've thought it, they've, it's been eight days and they've had time to think about this, in the back of their mind, they might be thinking, huh, I wonder if there's camera footage down that particular street that we drove or, you know, whatever the case is. But, but certainly one of those is, is, a, is a really good possibility. I know that they're looking and I went asking everybody and anybody. I know that they're looking. So that means, again, it goes back to that, you know, to prove that's mm -hmm. who she's talking about, the authorities. Yep. Yep. 
cameras, cameras, trail cams, stores. Um, <clears throat> so that's interesting. Eight days into this, the authorities are going. Oh, I like how she mentioned stores. Why did law enforcement take two weeks to get to that one store opposite uh, Sebastian's school? Two weeks. Now we're talking eight days here when this when she did this interview. Right. So why wasn't that store? Why didn't they go to that store sooner and collect any video from that store? Like such as she said she drove up round by the school. Now I took her on a Google map the other night. You can go cut through that school, drive through that school way, and it leads you right opposite that store. Well, it le leads you out to the uh, storage units. That's another subject in another day. But if you turn right out of that school drive, it takes you to the store. So why didn't the police go and get the video footage from that store? just to confirm that she had been rammed that way. Why? Uh, we're in, you know, <laughs> oh, your first statement, you know, because we don't know what the first statement is. This is, they went to the news on this one. Yeah. But I, I'm going to be really curious to hear that first statement. We'd love to hear it. To check, even from before he went missing, just to see if there's anything at all. You understand there, there was a request for video, any sort of footage of Sebastian from earlier in the day, on Sunday, before he disappeared. That I don't believe we can comment on right now. I don't, that is not something that I believe we're privy to at this point with law enforcement. That is something I would I would definitely direct back to them. But, I mean, they, there's all kinds of requests out there. There's thousands of hours of video that they are combing and... We're just hoping they'll find something. And although this is so sensitive, what do you say to people? And those thousands of hours can be narrowed down to about an hour with the technology that's available. Technology, yeah. Who inevitably, inevitably end up pointing their finger back at you. We were talking earlier. And, I mean, are you both in the clear? I can tell you that mom, myself, and the father have worked very fully and Cooperatively with all he's not answering the question. He skirted that question. We expect from both of them that I at the same time to be given a a, a, a absolute answer. Absolutely, that would be the word. Absolutely, yep. we're in the clear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We had nothing to do with this. Let's just get over this, and we'll we've offered to take polygraph to get our to clear our names and get on with the investigation to find him and focus on what, what whatever happened to him. Well, but she didn't say a thing. And then all he can say is, I can tell you we've cooperated. That's that's the only thing he can say about that. But that's that doesn't answer the question. Well, and two months later in the press release, or if you go to the TBI website, they, they say, and the sheriff just recently gave an interview, the, dep the uh, chief deputy, uh, we've not cleared anyone. So he's asking a question. She's he's asked that question. Have you been cleared? And he gives an answer that says, well, we're cooperating. And then the sheriff two months later says, we haven't cleared anybody. But here he's projecting into the public that, hey, there's a possibility. I've the dad, me, the mom, we've been, you know, we're, we're kind of copacetic here. Let's go back. This is important for the audience to catch this because this is eight days. OK, eight days. They're having to, quote, prove to the authorities, and he's saying, hey, we're cooperating, and two months later, the sheriff comes out and says, we haven't cleared anybody. That's exactly like Don and Candace yeah. in the Summer Wells case. Exactly. The sheriff has come out and said, no, but listen. And, I mean, are you both in the clear? I can tell you that mom, myself, and the father have worked very fully and cooperatively with all agencies across the board. We have anything that they've wanted, we have provided. Um, so cooperation is there. I mean, I mean you notice how he took himself out of that. Yeah. 
So cooperation is there. That's a passive statement, meaning he's not saying again that we're cooperating fully or whatever, but he's, uh, cooperation is there. That's 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 that, in other words, let me just say these words and let you interpret. I'm gonna let you mold that and in, into in, in whatever you want to do with that, interpret it. And and I always teach if you interpret, you lose. Listen to what they say. He disconnected himself psychologically from that statement regarding cooperation. Okay, hang on. I know this is so sensitive. What do you say to people who inevitably, inevitably end up pointing their finger back at you? We were talking earlier. And I mean, are you both in the clear? I can tell you that mom, myself, and the father have worked very fully and cooperatively with all agencies across the board. We have anything that they've wanted, we have provided. Um, so cooperation is there. I mean, what do you want to say to our viewers? Anybody who's watching, we've got a lot of folks. In he didn't answer the question. Yeah, he skirted it. He's com com completely to your point, completely 100%. Uh, it's like, well, it's kind of blue, but you know, it's, you know, it could be blue. It all depends <laughs> right. on, the sunlight, on the sunlight coming through the window. You make the determination. <laughs> right. Instead of this is, you know, of course we're cooperating. Our son's missing. You know, and of course, you know, we will do anything. And the authorities have cleared us. Go ask them. They have verified what I said from day one. I'm not hearing any of that. No. And in other counties, just throughout the state as well. What do you want to say now? Help spread the word and keep searching. And thank you. And and by the way, the reporter teed that question up. Yep. And she said to him, you know, like we talked about, i.e. before they went on air. So they had time to process of how they were of how he was going to answer that question. And it was interesting that he took that answer. Great. Um just if you think you see him call him in. I think all the viewers, everybody's helped from across the board. I mean everybody has been tremendous. Call his name. Yeah. He'll answer and if he doesn't answer, he'll at least he'll look. Even if he's not being verbal at the moment, because he can talk, but sometimes he don't talk. <laughs> Um, call his name, tell him to stay put. He could be on the move, so keep checking your properties. Yes. Like, the search is never over until he comes home. That is for so sure. so smart. But thank you for everything that everybody has done, has volunteered, uh, the continuous efforts. I mean, it's, like I said, this is, I've never seen something to this magnitude before. Our community is amazing. We're all praying and hoping and searching. Sebastian's safe return. Thank you. Let's not forget what this is about. That was a long interview, a long video. God, I've been on in nearly three hours. <laughs> oh, God. Um, but I felt it was only right to show it on here because even though I brought up some points about that video, that first interview, they've brought up a lot more. Why? Points, p words and what they've said, I didn't even notice. And how he shrug his shoulders like, oh, that's it. That's just how it is. You know what I mean? And so I found that very interesting. But I don't like the fact I keep referring to Summer Moon Utah Wells. It, this isn't Summer Moon Utah Wells, it's Sebastian Wayne Drake Rogers. I don't like the fact I keep bringing Summer Moon. I know she's been missing three years this year now. Three years. I know she's been missing a long time. But that's a separate case. I know it's in Tennessee. And there are very a lot of similarity similarities about this case and hers. But I, I just wish they'd just keep the two cases separate. Right? And like I said, they do always add on to their story. Which which they did, like in the other interview after this, with the hands. 
he kept start calling, he started calling her Kate, Katie, and saying his name, Sebastian. And then when people say, well, you heard the noise at 10 o'clock, but you didn't go. No, and then she brings in that point about how she heard the noise at 10 o'clock. Right? And people go, you heard him, you heard the noise, but you didn't go and check on him. And then she brings in that thing where, well, at 10 o'clock I heard a thud. And I called into him saying, was that you falling out of bed, Bubba? And he goes, no, Mum. And she goes, well, whatever you're doing, get to, get to bed or get to go to sleep. Right? I'm, I'm agreeing with him on here. I think it was between 9 and 10 p.m. Something went on in that house. Something happened in that house. And if you join me tomorrow, tomorrow I will discuss about the DNA and the transferring of her body and whether it would leave any DNA or any smell or anything in a car. Right? From like a, a body that's on a live. Would it leave a smell in a car? That's what I've been asking. Would a, a body leave a smell in a car? Because people have said once you get that smell, you just can't get rid of it. They say, I've read up cases today where they've had to rip off skirting boards, knock walls down and rebuild them because it's, the smell has got into the wall or into the floorboards and everything. So it's very, very potent sort of thing, smell. Anyway, that one we'll be discussing tomorrow night, unless something else comes up. <laughs> Hi. So I'd just like to say thank you to everyone who's watched this. Thank you for being here with me tonight, and taking your time out to come and listen to this interview. Well, it wasn't an interview, this video. And just to get another perspective on, you may not agree with what they're saying. That is your choice. Uh, the only thing I didn't agree with is how he kept saying, I, I wanted her to say this or something. No. You can't say that. You can't say, I wanted her to say this. You can say, I expected her to say this, or I expected her to do this. You know what I mean? You know, I want her to behave like this, or I want her to say this. You know, that's wrong. Right? You have to, he should have reworded it. He should have said, I expect her to say, this. I expect a mother to say this. Or I expect a mother to behave or act like this. So, anyway, that's my only downfall on that interview, was that. Anyway, thank you all for being here. And once, like I said, if you haven't already, hit that like button on the way out. And if you over on Twitter, thank you for watching and being here with me. Please think about coming over and subscribing. I'll really put a smile on my face. And um, I hope to see you all tomorrow night. Till then, good night.